So we're here this evening at the Alex Theatre hear what candidates running in the seat of Albert Park have to say about the issues that are most important to us in the lead up to the state election on November the 24th. We thought it was really important for issues specific to the area to be addressed in a forum like this. My name is Kate Arnott and I'm your host for tonight. I'm a journalist, journalism lecturer and most importantly a Port Melbourne resident. All right. This forum would not be possible without the hard work of Unchained Port Phillip, which partnered with LIV and then together they brought on board a really impressive list of some 20 other community groups in Port Phillip who have long histories of caring about their neighbourhood. So well done, congratulations to you guys. A big thanks also to the wonderful Alex Theatre where we are tonight, to the Port Phillip Leader and St Kilda News for their great support and the team from St Kilda News are also filming tonight's proceedings so thanks for that. We also welcome Port Phillip councillors here tonight. The community groups are incredibly grateful to everyone who've submitted questions on the forum.org.au website. We've been really impressed with the questions and it's been incredibly encouraging to be reminded of just how interested and passionate the community is about its well-being. There's a lot to get through, so we hope you understand that some of the questions have been amalgamated and condensed, so we're not all here till midnight, because I don't think anyone really wants that. And we'll also be taking some questions from the audience later in the evening. So to get things underway, let's introduce the five candidates that we have here tonight. As a criminal lawyer, our first candidate has advised government and not-for-profit organisations on the best methods to reduce drug and alcohol-related harms, as well as ways to prevent violence in the community. He also works as a lecturer in criminal law at RMIT University and is a board member of Harm Reduction Victoria. Please welcome Reason Victoria's candidate, Jared Bartle. All right, our next candidate has served Albert Park as a councillor at the City of Port Phillip since 2012. He had a career working for large national and multinational companies as well as homegrown businesses. He's been a member of the management committees for the South Melbourne Market and St Kilda Esplanade Market and volunteers at Sacred Heart Mission near his home in St Kilda. Please welcome to the stage Liberal Party candidate Andrew Bond. Now, Andrew will only be able to join us for an hour tonight as he has a long-standing booking at 8 o'clock. It is his birthday, so he's allowed to go and have a birthday dinner. So happy birthday to you, Andrew. We will ensure that you guys have a chance to ask some questions of Andrew before he leaves, so we'll make sure we do that for you guys. All right, our next candidate has been the member for Albert Park since 2007 and is a minister in the Andrews government. He has responsibility for the social justice portfolios of housing, disability and ageing, mental health, equality, as well as creative industries. Please welcome Labor candidate, Martin Foley. <laughs> right, this candidate arrived in Australia when he was 11 years old as a refugee after a civil war erupted in his hometown of Sarajevo. He's a Port Phillip councillor, a trained lawyer and long-standing social justice campaigner. Standing for the Greens, please welcome Oggy Simich. <laughs> Our final candidate for this evening is Dr Tamazin Ramsey. She's a former Melbourne paramedic and medical anthropologist. Tamazin became concerned about the rights and interests of other species when she was the NGO representative to the UN. Please welcome Animal Justice Party candidate, Dr. Tamazin Ramsey. <laughs> All right, candidates, we'd like to get to know a bit more about you now. So you will have four minutes to introduce yourselves and talk about what you want to achieve for this electorate. And again, so we're not here till midnight, we'll have time limits on how long you can speak throughout the evening. So for this section, you'll have four minutes each and a bell will ring when you have a minute left and the bell will ring again when your time is up and you will need to stop then. So we'll begin in the order that you were introduced in. So, Jared, if you'd like to continue, then we'll continue along the line. Hopefully I've got it on. Yep. Okay, got it. Um, so, as the wonderful introduction uh, indicated, my background is as a criminal lawyer and 
One of the, the, the key things that I want to bring to, to this area is an evidence-based approach to crime and drug-related harms. Um, unfortunately, we've got a, a law and order election uh, coming up, uh, and it's not the kind of policies or proposals putting, being put forward um, that actually have evidence behind them and that are actually going to reduce crime in the community. Reason has a suite of policies to deal with these sorts of issues. Uh, we support early intervention programs to identify youth at risk of antisocial behaviour and drug dependence. Um, we also support broad-ranging uh, support services, including harm reduction services, things like safe injecting facilities, things like drug checking facilities, uh, which reduce the harms of drug use in the community. Finally, on this area of safety uh, and criminal justice reform, we support actually having comprehensive rehabilitation programs for offenders. So not just, you know, throwing people in jail, housing them temporarily uh, so that they leave to reoffend in the community, actually having evidence-based rehabilitation programs to ensure that the crime rates go down. So there's some of the main things that have attracted me to the party and running as a candidate. Um, we also have comprehensive policies to do with accountability and transparency of institutions. So the Reason Party, formerly the Sex Party, has always consistently said that religious organisations um, do not uh, abide by community expectations under our current laws. Religious schools being able to uh, fire teachers or kick out students on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity is not on, and we support getting rid of that kind of free pass to discriminate. We also believe that taxation arrangements for religion are not in keeping with community expectations, particularly when religious organisations can run religious-based businesses, things like sanitarium, uh, and avail themselves of uh, religious exemptions. In terms of transparency in Parliament, we uh, are very concerned uh, about the influence of lobbyists on parliamentary decision making. So we're in favour of having a real time uh, reporting of political donations. We're also in favour of ministerial diaries being public. So if decisions are made uh, on developing uh, for, for development applications or anything like that, we want to know who was in the minister's ear at the time those decisions were made. Um, so we want, we want transparency in politics and we uh, want accountability there as well. Finally, as I said, used to be the sex party. Name change has happened, uh, but we are still the sex, drugs and rock and roll party deep down. Uh, <laughs> we're in favour of uh, legalisation of recreational uh, cannabis. Uh, we're in favour of decriminalising sex work, legalising uh, nicotine containing vaping products, which is one of, the, one of these issues that you don't often think about, but for people that are dependent uh, on tobacco smoke, it means a lot to them to be able to have a harm reduction resource legalised, and that's one of the things that I care about. Uh, we're generally an anti-censorship uh, uh, party, and we also just generally believe that adults should be let uh, to be adults, uh, and that we respect personal freedoms, and we won't support nanny state type policies that interfere with individual freedoms. So that's just a, a sample of things that I think would be uh, of interest to the residents of Albert Park. Uh, and if you were to elect me, those are the things that I would advocate for in a, in a hung parliament or in a, in a minority position. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this election is about a number of big issues, most notably crime and safety on our streets, not just here in St Kilda, but across the Albert Park electorate. And also congestion in our suburbs and in how we intend to deal with this in the future. Firstly, crime and safety on our streets. The question here to ask here is, who do you want to represent your interests and deal with crime and safety on your behalf? The answer, well, let's examine the record of those sitting on the stage. You have the current member for Albert Park who did nothing about the gangs on the beachfront despite 12 months of warnings and countless meetings with the foreshore traders. Until December 13th last year, when footage of the beachfront riots received national media attention. And from then on, for the rest of the summer, you couldn't move down there on the beachfront without running into a police officer or a police officer on horseback or a police officer on, on bicycle. But as soon as the TV cameras went away, so too did the police. 
You have the current member for Albert Park, who did nothing about the anti-social behaviour emanating from places like the Regal, despite six months of warnings from groups like the Friends of St Kilda Hill. And so a local celebrity was attacked, and once again the issue gained national media attention, and the area was flooded with police. Once again, and then this problem was solved with a $6 million donation to the Port Phillip Housing Association to refurbish the Regal. That was their reward for letting the area run down. And out of that $6 million came the money for the CCTV that has recently been installed on Grey Street and on Little Grey Street. If you're wondering why there are people currently sleeping on Fitzroy Street and we have insufficient funds for housing, it's because the housing portfolio has funded the CCTV on Grey Street and Little Grey Street. It should be coming out of crime prevention. This lot didn't. At the same time, we've got issues happening on the corner of Carlisle Street and Barclay Street. Residents and businesses in that area have been demanding action you let me finish. I'm, I'm getting to that. Okay, if you, can, if you could just be quiet and respectful at the moment, please. But, Andrew, we do need to make sure we stick to what you want to do for the electorate for this section. Thank you. So, I'll get to that. Thank you. I've got a couple of minutes left. Thank you. At least the Greens are honest. They don't care about your safety and they don't care what you're thinking about them not caring about your safety. In 2015, I ensured council approved CCTV for Fitzroy Street. Okay, please, please, the candidates have a right to be heard, so please let Andrew continue. In 2015, I ensured council approved CCTV for Fitzroy Street, despite having to deal with a council in which the majority of councillors were against CCTV. And in Ju July 2015, voted against it. It's not just some councillors on the current council who don't care about your safety. Back then, just like now, I was assisted by traders of Fitzroy Street and residents in the local area, enforcing that council to agree to CCTV, just like the traders and the residents of Fitzroy Street have forced the current council to agree to CCTV. I will... I fought for the third, second lot of cameras on the beachfront, the third lot of cameras on Grey and Little Grey. I will work with residents and traders again to pursue future CCTV requirements for St Kilda and elsewhere in Albert Park, for which I've secured $5,000, $500,000 from crime prevention, not just housing, to supply that. And I'll leave it there, thank you. Okay, we'll hear from Martin Foley next, thank you. Uh, thank you, and I'd begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and particularly acknowledge the Yalik Willem of the Bunurong and pay my respects to that community. This election, like all elections, is about the future of not just our community, but the state. And as a government that came into power four years ago, that set out clearly what its agenda was and has progressively and consistently ticked off those bold reforms, we come before you today as a government, and I as the candidate for Albert Park, to yet again set out a positive plan for a progressive future for our, uh, for our government to deliver on behalf of all Victorians, and particularly uh, my role for the people of the District of Albert Park, which stretches from the Arts Centre Spire at one corner, to the Botanical Gardens in St Kilda at the other and all the communities in between. And uh, we believe that the bold reforms that we have begun to roll out, particularly in areas of infrastructure, public transport, uh, health and education, the environment, energy, uh, that these are the kind of things when you add to the progressive programs in our record spending in education, lifelong education, from early childhood all the way through to uh, post-school education, that these are, the, these are the measures that mean a civilised country, a civilised state in a booming state can shape not just our community but our state as the place in which uh, we can have a better, sustainable, fairer future in a growing community. Uh, we know that the population pressures and the growth pressures on the state 
let alone our own community, are pivotal. And that's why one of the key issues that nicely reflects all of this is the future of Fishman's Bend. Uh, a huge area in this electorate, every single square inch of the Fishman's Bend precinct is in the district of Albert Park. And that is one of the linchpin sites that is not only such a huge area, but it is where we can get the future of our community, the future of the kind of state and city that we want to be, right. And fixing up the mess that was inherited by our community following uh, the decisions of the former Minister for Planning in 2012 to rezone overnight is one of those niche, and pardon me, not niche, but one of those pivotal pillar issues that can decide which way, not just our community, but our state and our capital city can go for the future. We can make the decision about going down a path of uh, laissez-faire um, uh, capital development at the whims of developers, or we can have a community-driven, seriously infrastructure-funded, upfront uh, engagement process to get that process right. And I'd like to think that the mechanisms we've put in place can use Fisherman's Bend as a key example of how we can get things right. But whether it's in the areas of uh, health, education, employment, planning and amenity, culture, uh, and we'll get onto that, I'm sure, uh, the aspects that we in the District of Albert Park have in not just shaping our community's future, but shaping a better, bold future for the rest of our, our town as a global city of five million, let alone the rest of our state as a state of seven million, are really exciting and I look forward to the opportunity of presenting that positive plan, not just for this community, but of all the state and uh, seeking your support in delivering that plan. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, uh, I'm Ogi Simic and I too would like to start by acknowledging the Yalika Wulun clan of the Boon Wurrung, pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging, and indeed any elders uh, here with us tonight. There's a cliche that every election is the most important election. At election time, every candidate and political party trots out the same old lines and rhetoric that you hear every few years. But the reality is, this Victorian state election is one of the most important elections we face because we're at a tipping point in Victoria, and indeed nationally. It's a tipping point between investing in people and in our climate, and the communities and societies we build, or whether we continue to support division and fear. I came to Australia um, as a refugee, as was mentioned at the start. My family was lucky. We were warmly welcomed into the community and given access to safe and affordable uh, social housing and quality public education. I'm running to be your representative in the state parliament because I want people to have the same opportunities that I had. But more importantly, I want to put people back at the heart of politics. When I'm asked what's the biggest difference between the Greens and Labor and Liberal, I answer by pointing out that we believe our role as elected representatives is to create societies and communities that are serviced and supported to meet the needs of everyone, of all of us. The reality is that Melbourne is a growing city. The world is big and getting bigger, but the problems that we face are not unique. How we address these issues, housing and accommodation, homelessness, transport, our environment, issues like substance abuse, poverty, financial stress, finding the best medical and mental health care is what sets the Greens apart from the old parties. <laughs> to manage these complex issues, we need new ways of doing things, new ways of living that are sustainable and affordable, new ways of supporting people to find safe and secure ways to live, new ways of transporting five million people around a huge city, new ways of assisting the vulnerable and at risk. And most definitely new ways of helping innocent people who come here seeking a safe asylum, uh, seeking asylum from a war zone. Australians are turning away, thank you. Australians are turning away from the old Liberal and Labor parties because they no longer offer policies that work now or visions for the future. The Greens have been around for some time now and people have seen what we can achieve in Parliament at a state and territory and national level. It's the Greens that have delivered on mental and physical health care, on helping people with substance abuse and other problems, 
on trying to increase new start and welfare payments so people do not end up in crisis, on planning, on transport, on environment, and on a vision for a less divisive society. The Greens don't single out people of colour or ethnic groups or those who want to make Melbourne their home and blame them for everything. That's what candidates do when they have nothing to offer. They offer hate and division. They warn that if their opponents are elected, the world will end. I don't have that message. If you want more of the same, that's a choice you can make at the election. But if more of the same isn't working for you anymore, then this election you can vote for the Greens and help create a future for everyone that is fortunate enough to call Albert Park. Your vote is powerful. Thank you. Thanks, Okay, Dr. Tennyson. So, hi everyone, and I feel great being here. I thought I'd tell you a bit about me, um, because of, I'm the candidate, <laughs> and you'll know a bit about the party, but if I'm the candidate, you may want to know a few things about me. So I spent my earliest childhood living in a very small house on a very big piece of land on a mountain outside of Bega. I was an only child and we lived off grid. And my adventures were in the forest and my adventures were in the bush and I, every day I, I saw the wonder of nature and I experienced the intelligence and beauty of other, spe other species. It was very natural to me. Then at the age of seven, I moved into this area and I went to, um, it, well back then it was a Greek working class uh, suburb, it was the area, it was the only place we could afford to live. And I went to Albert Park High School, which was voted the worst high school in Melbourne in 1983. <laughs> we wore that with a badge of honour. <laughs> and I know all the Greek swear words also. <laughs> Uh, after that, in the 90s, I worked as a paramedic on the streets of Melbourne and that's where I got to see um, street life, homelessness, drugs, crime, vulnerability. It was a privilege, actually, to see, to have people invite you into their homes, into their lives when they're particularly vulnerable, particularly in need. I then somehow managed to earn my PhD in medical anthropology. After that, I moved to New York. Now, that was the first time I really got interested in politics. Before that, I thought of myself as apolitical. But then, doing anthropology and being at the UN, representing civil society, you quite quickly get to see that every, every human being is a political actor. Maybe all you knew that. I didn't know that. Um, I worked um, primarily in the in the area of environment, sustainability and climate change, negotiating on behalf of civil society. One thing I noticed was that all of our policies only looked after the interests and rights of a very small minority. Humans comprise 0.02 of 1% of life on Earth. 99.98% of life on Earth is non-human living, breathing, feeling, experiencing life. And my concern at the UN was that nobody was discussing it. Nobody would talk about animal agriculture. Nobody would talk about any of the, all of the other issues surrounding um, in our environmental po policies that affect oceans, that affect habitat, that affect all these things that we make decisions on summarily dismissing the rights and interests of other species. So we can say it's their habitat, but it's also our habitat. When we look after others, we look after ourselves, And it's absolutely that way in any kind of ecosystem. In Australia, 83% of people believe not enough is being done about animal welfare. All the other parties offer something good, but what we offer that the other parties don't is policies that embrace 100% of individuals with rights and interests. Um, 63% of people in Albert Park live with a companion animal. We have 160 species of bird here, 10,000 species in the, in the bay that we may not even think about. So we're, we're here to encourage the major parties and to hopefully win a seat. It would be amazing to win a seat and be able to sit there in a minority position but with a voice to advocate on the, on the behalf of 100% of, of life in the state, in Australia and in Albert Park. Thank you.
Thank you, Tamazin. Tamazin's now going to head back to the audience for this part of the part of proceedings and will rejoin us later for the general Q&A. Or you can stay up here if you like. It's up to you. <laughs> it's up to you. Cool. All right, great. All right. So let's dive deeper into the topics now and we're going to begin with livability and to introduce this topic, can you please welcome to the stage architect and planner, Rob McGoran. Thank you very much and for all of you attending this evening, um, I think hopefully we'll all have brains that are aching at the end of the evening with lots of good ideas that we've heard during the course of it. Um, but when I was asked to uh, consider livability in the context of Albert Park, um, I had cause to reflect on it through the lens of um, being a local resident for 30 plus years uh, on one hand and asking myself what had changed, both good and bad. Being on the advisory committee to the Minister for Planning for Fisherman's Bend and uh, exploring futures for key change areas there and as part of that work I uh, took myself on some self-funded visits to what were considered best practice globally in that space. And sort of relevantly, I think, uh, as an ambassador for Future Melbourne 2026, where I had the opportunity in that context, which I often don't get as an architect, to talk to lots of people in the thousands about their vision um, for the uh, future and, uh, and, uh, and what would make a livable Melbourne, um, albeit in that case, residents primarily, uh, residents and businesses primarily within the city of Melbourne. But I thought I might share a little bit that came out of that inquiry, which was really um, some key themes that the residents and stakeholders posed back to the city in that case about what they cared about for the future, which I found was quite benevolent um, and forward thinking. Their first goal was a city that cares for its environment as a key platform that would sustain us all. The second was a city for people, you know, the idea that it was wholly inclusive um, and valued all of its uh, citizens. The third was a creative city. The fourth, a prosperous city, a city able to reinvest in itself. The fifth was a knowledge city, a city that asked itself hard questions and in encouraged um, inquiry and, and um, and an evidence base. The sixth was a connected city. The seven, a deliberative city, one that actually sought the opinions of many to uh, resolve uh, wicked problems. The eighth was a city managing change. And the ninth was a city with an Aboriginal focus. So I'll just uh, park those, but I thought they were quite interesting to sort of broaden our thinking early. When I look at the electorate, we see how challenging such a set of goals is. You know, we're facing uncertain futures for things as basic as waste management um, and uh, the future of how we do that sustainably. We're still struggling to get from our leaders an agreement on a low energy future and how we get there and provide clarity to both businesses and everyone about, well, what is the plan? We're still suffering from repeated bipartisan, I might say, over time, poor management of urban growth historically. That is until recently seen continuing repurposing of our best arable land for tracked housing and increased motor vehicle dependency um, if we measure performance against kilometres driven modal mix and impact on our environments and ecosystems arising from that. Through the lens of the city, our livability has been historically nurtured, particularly in this uh, location, but also across Melbourne, by the diversity of cultures, backgrounds, demographics and incomes. I'm sure if we looked at the, if we took the DNAs of all of our uh, people on the stage, we'd find a really diverse um, group of Heinz Terriers, really, in terms of 101 varieties, uh, uh, making up that as it is in my case too. Um, but um, at the same time, we've seen in this booming city um, increasing disadvantage, both manifest in 
homelessness that we've seen in the streets, but also in the diminishing uh, diversity of our own community. Um, I was just looking at the latest figures from DHHS today and we now have um, just over 1% of all housing available for rental in this municipality being able to be afforded by very low, low and moderate income households for rent, not to buy. Buying was lost long ago. Despite thousands of units being approved um, in Fisherman's Bend, delivering very substantial profits to incumbent landowners, I, know, I won't say those that have purchased and applied for permits since, but incumbent landowners, I'm not aware of any that voluntarily proposed affordable housing as a component or affordable workplace provision. Gentrification is indeed widespread and we have clear evidence that the private sector has and the market has not delivered um, an inclusive uh, city if that is a measure by which this community uh, views livability. And it may not, but um, it's one that I'd like uh, some discussion about. If livability relies partly though on cultural richness services and care being the best and most authentic it can be, we should continue to challenge the assumption that the market will deliver it and deliver, uh, deliver the sustainable future. So I'll, I'll be interested to learn from our panel what sort of community do they seek to enable in Albert Park and what policies and initiatives do they propose to put in place to deliver that. So. The good thing that, we're in uh, that we have in place now is that there is at least a city plan. We have Plan Melbourne. And the bones of an infrastructure plan delivered by an independent agency, Infrastructure Victoria, that enables that plan, whatever you think of it, to uh, be delivered for the future city. Whilst there is uncertainty about the nature of future work, we have seen the increasing um, importance of proximity, um, and environments that support collaboration as key um, modes to um, bringing the world's best talent to Melbourne and to drive our agility in response to changing opportunities and challenges. And we have widespread agreement amongst the world's scientific community about the challenge facing us to ensure our planet continues to nurture and sustain us in living well. We can and do measure a lot more that enables us to make better coordinated evidence-based decisions if we want to look at that evidence. We can also look back, and I think this is what I would like to hear from our audience tonight, and I can look back, and I'm sure many of you can look back on historic successes and marvel at the ambition to be a great place and to be an inclusive city that um, our forebears um, have given to us. And equally, we can see the many examples where poor and short-term decisions were made. So, I'll be interested to learn from these candidates tonight what they see as the big challenges for our livability and what they see as the key responses to these challenges. So, if I can um, ask this question in alphabetical order from... I'm very mindful of the time, so if you just want to speak to the topic of livability, each candidate, please, for two minutes each, and then we'll, we'll ask a couple of quick questions. So we'll start with... Um, Jared. Oh, it's on. Okay, good. Um, so, I mean, some of the key things that come out of that discussion that I think are important uh, to emphasise are something that I, I noted in my introduction, which is we're having these decisions about uh, development and about the kind of, of place that, that we're going to live in, um, whether that is to do with planning in, in terms of infrastructure or whether that is to do with, like we saw with Fisherman's Bend, you know, height restrictions on buildings that are being put up and things like that. Those sorts of decisions, when they're being made by state governments, I think it's, it's really important, first of all, that we know why they're making those decisions, who's been in their ear, and that there is transparency. And secondly, that as much as is possible, uh, given these long-term plans, uh, that there is ongoing consultation with the local community. 
So one of the key things that, that Reason uh, really wants to put out there um, a, as an idea to bring to the table is the use of citizen juries, um, which would allow for these sorts of livability policies to be informed by local communities and final decisions actually being made by the local communities and not this top-down approach, which I know has caused so much outrage locally. From my point of view, the key to improving the livability of Melbourne is going to be vast improvements in our public transport as we see it, uh, not just across our, our local area, but across the state. Uh, locally here in St Kilda, we had the, the Ackland Street tram stop uh, built, which is just a wonderful repurpose of a public space. Uh, very, you know, the previous council was right behind that, pushed that project, um, took it right right through to completion. I think it's worked out to be such a, a great space there. Uh, Fisherman's Bend, the key to getting Fisherman's Bend right is going to be having the, the correct tram and also deep underground rail connection through Fisherman's Bend. Uh, no matter what alignment there is, there's still a couple of proposed alignments down there. Uh, but we, we need to decide on that and that will should underpin the rest of the Fisherman's Bend plan. It's very hard to say where, where the appropriate locations are for 40 storey buildings versus four storey buildings uh, without knowing exactly where the train's going to go. So those are the sorts of decisions that, that a, a government needs to make uh, in the next couple of years. So that places like Fisherman's Bend can be appropriately planned uh, for the future. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I think those nine um, measures that you outlined that underpin the now locked into law Fisherman's Bend uh, planning amendments reflect the kind of vision that came out of an extensive consultation process with community, with developers, with governments, but with an active government driving the process. If you take the view that markets are going to solve things, particularly when it comes to livability, then you're going to fail the first test of livability. The test to making sure that not just Melbourne, but that Victoria is a livable place, livable in the best sense of being inclusive, democratic and sustainable, it's by government taking an active leadership role. And I think the measures that we've seen this government commit to in the last election and deliver uh, over the last four years reflect that. So like you, I take the view that all of the issues that flow from the Fishman's Bend precinct shape not just the District of Albert Park, but Melbourne and Victoria, and how we build livability, public transport, heritage, commitment to public democratic spaces being built into those processes in a way that uh, is sustainable and endurable and participatory is the kind of vision that I would like to see underpinning not just planning decisions by uh, agencies but governments and setting the rules for the private sector to partner in that, understanding that uh, very, very f few inches indeed of uh, the Fisherman's Bend area are actually in state hands. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, what, uh, Albert Park is a wonderful place to live uh, and raise uh, my family. The big challenge you asked for, I think our population is growing uh, and the question is how we manage this. We're not D Donald Trump and we're not going to build a big wall uh, around Melbourne and tell uh, everybody that they're not welcome. I'll touch on three key issues, uh, housing, um, planning and transport. The Greens believe that housing is a fundamental human right. Uh, access to secure, appropriate and affordable housing is a crucial determinant of health and well-being. Most importantly, uh, safe and secure housing supports social participation, as we talked about earlier, uh, and it means people can access employment and social services. And I was shocked to hear that only 1% of uh, housing uh, in uh, rentals in, in City of Port, uh, in Albert Park uh, are affordable renting. Unlike the old parties, the Greens want public land and housing assets set, set aside for public housing retained in public ownership, and I'm sorry, Minister, not privatised. Most critically, the Greens planning practices will increase the provision of ecological sustainability, affordable and diverse housing stock with increased engagement of local government in delivering local solutions. Uh, when it comes to planning, 
Uh, the Greens believe that cities should be built for people uh, and not the playground of property developers. As our city has grown, we have experienced a disturbing trend of both major parties selling off land to developers who value profits over livable communities. When a key area of land is up for development, green infrastructure, social housing is often an afterthought, if a thought at all. There is no clearer ca case in point than in Fisherman's spent, where a green light was given to developers without a strategy, uh, value capture, uh, all funds for uh, decontaminating public transport, open space or affordable housing. Uh, we need to hand back the power to residents by banning the corrupt influences of developer donations and make public participation central to the planning in our city. And I know I'm over time, but just briefly on transport, I will say um, that in order to make our city livable, the Greens believe that new urban developments should be integrated with environmental, public transport and employment strategies and facility community interaction. Uh, and I hope that we get to speak about transport some more tonight as well. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Okay, um, we're mindful that Andrew Bond does have to leave shortly, so Rob, if I can ask you to ask your best burning question, and just candidates, one minute each, please, on this question. S S I'll be brief. So what we would recommend is that any kind of development includes wildlife corridors and, <laughs> and, and open space and passive recreation to aid in human flourishing as well as providing habitat for other species. Thanks, thanks Tamas. And I'll get your um, inputs on this one too if you feel that there's um, some... Um, contribution you'd like to make. I'd like to make it a very focused to this electorate now um, and be interested if you could uh, um, answer uh, this. Firstly, what do you see as the key challenges through this livability lens for this electorate? And what are the particular policies and projects that you see need to be delivered in Al Albert Park for you to consider that we've charted a course for future generations that we'll be proud of. So starting with Jared. Um, so speaking broadly about livability, clearly uh, the cost of renting and the cost of housing in the area is one of the, the key challenges um, that needs to be made. Um, and added upon that is, you know, one of the key ways that we can, can make more affordable housing in the area is to actually increase uh, housing density in the area, to actually increase the, the available housing in the area, and to do so in a way that does respect community expectations. There's no, there's, uh, it's not worth just lowering housing prices through mass development uh, by some sort of commercial developer um, if that doesn't, uh, doesn't result in a thriving community that actually has you know, resources and that can actually uh, thrive. So that's one of the, the key uh, challenges that we need to face. And I think, again, it comes down to that local consultation uh, to ensure that that's done in a way that we can achieve those goals of affordable housing in the area uh, whilst uh, not turning into what would have been in Fisherman's Bend, that kind of worst case scenario uh, of high rises and overdevelopment. One of the biggest challenges I've uh, seen for our local area is, is the new and emerging economy, the shared economy. And the best example of that we have at the moment is something like Airbnb. Thanks. Uh, something like Airbnb, which is having a twofold impact on, on our society. The first one and the immediate one is, it goes to probably a little bit of what Jared said, where, where housing stock taken up by Airbnb is reducing the, the amount of housing that's out there available in the community and making less stock available for people, which is driving up the price of rents. The second element is the impact that Airbnb's are having where buildings, entire buildings are being treated like hotels uh, without having the, the resources and the support of a hotel night like network. And residents, as our city uh, densifies, are having to put up with uh, 
Airbnb impacts on, on their neighbourhood, on their amenity, on their building, and the wear and tear on the building. So there's a, there's a twofold reason why we need to get on top of that if, as this, this city uh, grows denser. So what I would like to see is the, identify as the key challenges go to issues around planning, and we keep coming back to Fisherman's Bend because it is the single biggest planning challenge in Melbourne, if you ask me, let alone uh, the District of Elba Park. And making sure that those early investments in public open space, uh, delivering both the above ground uh, tram network and the uh, underground Metro 2, uh, pivoting off Metro 1, is a key d driver of diversity of options for making it that uh, active transport, transport based area. Add to that the whole issues around the new economy in the employment precinct clustered around the old GM site and the fact that the University of Melbourne are moving their um, postgraduate engineering and IT facilities in there starting next year gives us an unprecedented opportunity to get all of that right. I would also say that housing and housing diverse options, uh, not just in Fisherman's Bend but more broadly, the District of Albert Park has a majority of its residents renting. Uh, that's unusual uh, across the rest of Melbourne. And the fact that uh, this government has delivered the strongest package of renters' rights in a generation with more to come uh, is particularly important. Add to that the notion that uh, we need to become that knowledge-based education area and a sustainable community, uh, how we build into that our uh, energy re renewable legislative commitment uh, to make sure that we hit the 40% target of energy and uh, production of energy sources by 2025 is a real driver, not just for the state, but given the total policy absence at a federal level, how we can drive those uh, outcomes at a national and meet our international obligations uh, in that space. Put all those together, I see those as the key drivers of how livability can be embedded into our community. Thank you, Minister. So the question, um, biggest problem, uh, like I was said, uh, I think one of the key challenges for us is that we have a growing population. In fact, we've got seven new people moving into the area uh, every day and by 2030 our population is likely to increase by 30%. Um, I've already talked about uh, housing. I think that homelessness is a violation of human rights and inconsistent with a compassionate society, so we need to address that first and foremost. Um, and uh, thinking about Fisherman's Bend, uh, I think what's been said so far is mostly uh, correct. One of the uh, great things is that there's a framework for Fisherman's Bend uh, currently. Uh, one of the disappointing things is that we're going into this election without a funding and finance plan for Fisherman's Bend. Uh, in order to make sure that the 80,000 new people coming into the area uh, are coming into an area that's livable. We need open space, we need community space, we need public transport, the tram and metro too. Uh, we need uh, hospitals, we need uh, social housing and in fact the Greens plan is um, for any new housing stock to 30% of it to be um, dedicated to social housing. And like I, oh sorry. Uh, I was actually going to talk about transport. I keep getting cut off at transport all the time, but that's okay. No, no, we'll hopefully get to it a bit later uh, once more. So I'll pass on to Tamazin. Thank you. Uh, look, th thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on all these issues. Um, we do have policies on a lot of these things, but um, I can speak briefly to it. So we have a policy on urban sprawl. That's something that that affects the whole state, but it also affects us in uh, Fisherman's Bend. The, we're going so fast and so quickly and developing so rapidly, it's kind of, it's at a non-human pace. It's, it's such, a, such an industrial pace that I don't think we can keep up and that's affecting our livability. And we saw the recent thing, um, One Victoria Avenue, which thanks to Labor and the work of a, a lot of other people, um, that was stopped. Now that can really affect our liv livability. So we're just trying to say slow down and a lot of our policies do say let's slow down, um, appreciate what we've got, upcycle, recycle, small scale economies, habitat for all of us, that kind of thing. That's our approach. 
candidates, thank you very much. And thank you very much to you, Rob. We'd very much like to return to your, the rest of your questions during the general Q&A, so thank you very much. We'd like to move on to crime and safety now, and I'd like to bring to the stage St Kilda resident and Herald Sun journalist, Selby Stewart. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I can see some concerned faces, Herald Sun journalists talking about crime and safety. For some, maybe a bit like a pyromaniac talking about bushfire safety. But <laughs> I, can assure, I can assure you that there's, there's nothing to worry about. I do come to you as, as a resident um, and a full-time community member. Uh, I've grown up in St Kilda and lived here my whole life. I walked to primary school, St Kilda Park, across the road on Fitzroy Street from a very young age because my parents have always felt safe here. My friends and I, as curious teenagers, wandered the streets from Elwood to Port Melbourne at night, and we did so because we felt safe and we never got into trouble. Granted, we were a group of young men. I've spent the last few weeks speaking with people in the community about what it means to be safe. A policeman from South Melbourne told me that he believed there were two limbs to community safety. The first is being safe from physical and emotional harm, both at home and on the street. Here, it's important to recognise that reported criminal incidents have decreased in the past 12 months in our area, down by 720 incidents per 100,000 people since this time last year with a growing population. And the other limb, the officer said, was the perception of safety, how safe people feel. And that, he believed, was the most difficult to tackle. It is clear from my discussions that crime and safety is a complex and multifaceted issue. And for some here, this is their biggest concern. The closure of the Gatwick, the Regal, intermittent media coverage, the foreshore booze ban and CCTV are just some of the recent developments that have punctuated this debate. There are those here who see a vulnerable person on the street yelling obscenities or unabashed drug use near their home or business and, and this does make them feel unsafe. There's Doug whose grandkids no longer visit because of tenants next door who he says are violent. But others see a lack of social support and housing. The product of funding cuts to frontline services. There are stories like Sheldon, who sells the big issue on Ackland Street, recently struck by a car a month ago, left on the side of the road. Between housing at the time, Sheldon stumbled to a friend's house, unable to recover in a home of his own. Not having stability, Sheldon says, makes him feel unsafe. Patrick Lawrence, CEO of First Step, told me last year that, secu th that the security that housing provides for vulnerable members of our community is unparalleled. It is safety from both harm and addiction. Statistically, there is no crime wave in our area, but there are social issues that people are genuinely concerned about. Whether it's improved engagement with our most vulnerable, funding for social services, more crisis accommodation, greater police presence, support for business owners, more lighting or safe injecting rooms. Residents have told me that they do want a clear and effective policy to keep all members of our community safe, especially those who need it most. I'll now hand it over to the candidates to talk about this issue. Thank you. Selby, thank you. Because Andrew has to go, Andrew Bond, we'll, we'll start with you and just give you some questions so that you can be released. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hear daily from residents and business owners on Fitzroy Street and Ackland Street that they do not feel safe. I also hear from people who constantly say to me, what are you talking about? I feel safe down there. You cannot tell people how they feel. Some people do feel safe. I often feel safe down there, but there are times when I'm sitting down there that you have to look around and say, this is not a safe environment. I've spoken to, to many residents who have lived in St Kilda for 25, 30 years who are saying to me, I've had enough, I'm, I'm thinking about leaving. They're constantly putting up with antisocial issues in their street, in their area. They don't let their children outside to play anymore, whereas previously they used to do that. There's a number of things we can do. First of all, we need an increased police presence. There are many traders down there and many residents who have given up ringing the police because they know they don't get a response. Um, you can search the, the Facebook pages across all the St Kilda and you see story after story after story from traders and residents who say, I had this issue, I couldn't get a police response. 
as well as more police, we need to give police better resources and CCTV is one of those. It is very important, not just for ev evidence gathering, not just for after the events, uh, after the event activities, but also it helps the police allocate resources to an event as it's happening. They can look at the camera and say, that's fine, that person, we know who they are, we only need to see two, send two officers, one car, or they could look at the cameras and say, that's that person we've been looking for, we better get everyone down there. As happened when, when the person was stabbed outside the St Kilda cellars. The police were sitting there on the CTV watching that as it occurred and saw the stabbing take place in real life. They were searching for that person and were sitting there discussing, is it him, is it not? Person got up, stabbed someone. So these sorts of resources are things we really need to give our police in the local area to help not just the perception of safety, but to help traders and residents feel much safer across St Kilda. All right, we will hear from the other candidates shortly on crime and safety, but before Andrew goes, does anyone have a question on crime and safety and on any other matters? Yes, would you like to come up the front? All right, great, go for it. <laughs> There's never been a proposal come to us for CCTV on Ackland Street. And I voted against the alcohol ban on the foreshore because I don't believe the alcohol ban down there is the problem. We've, alcohol down there has, is not the cause. It's not the people sitting there having a beer that's the problem. I've watched residents down there who were sitting there um, minding their own business, having one stubby, one beer. They're not causing the problem. The problem is the people who will sit there and get absolutely hammered. And we already have so many laws in place to deal with those people. If you're violent, if you're aggressive, we have laws in place to deal with that. If you're drunk in a public place, we have laws in place to deal with that. We do not need more laws and more bans to, to make that area better. There's enough laws in place to do that. Um, and I don't want to penalise the people who want to go down there with a glass of wine, just sit there, watch the sunset, and that's the only people that will be impacted by those laws. There are lots of people who go down there, get drunk, and nothing ever happens to them. Yet the, the resident who just wants to wander across the road from their house down the front there, have a glass of wine, one beer after work, they're the ones that are penalised by that, and I didn't support that. All right, are there any other questions for Andrew before he leaves? Yes, over here. Would you like to come up? It's probably better that you speak into the microphone so everyone can hear. That'd be great. Hi, Andrew. I think I've heard about CCTV footage enough, or CCTV and the use of it. I'm really interested to know, to connect the livability conversation and the safety conversation, what's your policy platform and how are you going to take care of the people that are vulnerable and in need? Because we've heard tonight a little bit about crime and safety and a little bit about livability. And I connect the two. And, and a diverse, you know, inclusive community means keeping those people safe, if you like, that are our most vulnerable. The people without housing, the people that we talk about that do criminal behaviour on the street. What's the policy platform and what kind of budget, legislative, you know, framework are you going to put forward to take care of those people? One of the areas I'm most passionate about is ensuring that we have standards, not just for public housing, but for also the rooming houses in our local area. At the moment, there are no standards that apply to these places. The residents of those places are most impacted by those, the lack, fact there are no standards. I mean, I know it impacts the, the neighbours. We hear a lot from the neighbours and the, the neighbouring residents about what it is that they would like to see. But the people most impacted are those that actually live in places like the Regal, those that lived in places like the Gatwick that had to put up with the behaviour that was occurring in those premises. There was nothing in place for council or the state to go down there and say, here is a minimum standard that you must meet. And if you can't meet those minimum standards, we will impose it and we will shut you down if you cannot meet that. The Regal and the Gatwick were a drain on this community for so long because there was nothing there that we could say to them, here is the standard you must meet. And the people most impacted were the residents of those particular places. Just to and jump in there, um, Martin Foley, did you want to respond to that, um, that there were no standards in, in rooming houses? 
Uh, if you would like me to, yes. Um, uh, I think that's um, not true, is the short answer. Um, there are standards that uh, underpin in the Residential Tenancies Act, in the section headed Rooming House Standards, uh, that talk about the minimum physical standards that uh, organisations must meet. In terms of the wider set of wraparound support, uh, I think there is uh, substantial more work that needs to be done in that area. And uh, I would just point to the fact that when you rip out $335 million out of the housing budget, as happened between 2010 and 2014, uh, then you're not going to get much wraparound support uh, for vulnerable people in whatever their housing situation will, may well be. And this government, both through its, its additional $1 billion worth of investment in public and social housing that it has delivered over the course of the last four years, with a particular focus on housing, uh, rough sleeping and homelessness and the frontline services uh, which this community is particularly rich in, has seen, uh, despite the many issues that uh, are regularly before us, has seen a stabilisation of the homelessness and rough sleeping rate that has made us, uh, compared to our northern uh, friends in New South Wales, a rate that has at least over four years now stabilised to make it uh, through ABS statistics, not uh, government statistics from Victoria, uh, are now on the verge of trying to be able to turn that around. There is so much more we have to do, but after four years of solid investment and particularly assertive outreach work with the likes of the Sacred Heart Mission, Launch Housing, the Selvos and a range of others, we know that uh, we can turn this around and we're starting to see the first green shoots of that. Thank you, Martin. Andrew, do you have time for one more question? Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah. yeah great, all right. Uh, two, two questions. Are there, any, are there any aspects of the um, current safe school project that you'd like to delete if you got into government, any part of the program? And secondly, Given that we, uh, the state of Victoria loses $100 million a year on the Formula One Grand Prix, why don't you vote, if, or will you vote in government if you get in to move it to Avalon? Firstly, the Safe Schools Program. My, my preference is to give schools and parents the choice to determine what is taught in their schools. If there's material there that they feel is inappropriate, then the schools and the parents should decide that that is inappropriate for the students. If there's material there that they think that is appropriate, it's entirely up to the schools and the parents and the school board to determine what they would like there to be taught in their schools. Uh, that, that's a, something I think we're supporting. And we certainly, you know, it's each school to determine the maturity of their students, what it is they think their students can deal with, what it is they, they think should be taught to their students. Um, so yeah, that's I've got no issues with that whatsoever. And on the Grand and the Grand Prix, well, that's I think we've found that's a decision we won't have to make till about 2025. The, the current government locked that away for another eight years. Uh, so in, if I was successful to be elected to Albert Park, it won't come up during that four-year term. It's been locked away. I think was it 2025, Martin? You locked it away till. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not going to have to worry about that one, Marcus. Okay, please thank Andrew Bond for his time here this evening and have a lovely birthday celebration. All right, we will now get the other candidates to address the topic of, of crime and safety. Martin, you can probably have a little less time, so thank you for, for jumping in there. After that, we will have a quick break. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Augie Simich, would you like to address the topic of crime and safety? Sure, thank you very much and thank you for the um, introduction, Sylvie. Uh, housing and crime and safety are often factors of poverty, inequality and financial hardship. I think it's important to say that first and foremost. We'll never be able to address these problems unless we address poverty and the growing inequality in Australian community. Under Liberal and Labor, unfortunately, inequality has widened. The gaps in society are everywhere around us. Just go outside and see the number of people sleeping rough tonight. And behind closed doors, people are making choices about whether to get 
uh, their medication or feed their kids. Uh, the Greens will deliver a comprehensive, multidisciplinary and evidence-based approach to reducing crime but, uh, by addressing the underlying causes. We support the establishment of community programs managed at local level to increase the community engagement of those at risk uh, or committing crime. We'll support proper training for all police officers and PSOs in dealing safely with difficult situations. The police need better support and training to help them manage uh, armed offences or people with mental illness and those under influence or alcohol abuse. And the Greens will invest in our police force by providing the proper training for all police officers to engage respectfully and effectively with complaints of family violence, sexual offences and child abuse. If locking everyone up and being tough on crime worked, you'd think America would be the safest place in the world. The Greens prisons policies are based on world evidence uh, of uh, what works. Uh, you'll see more funding for services and staffing to support community correction orders. You'll see all those in Victorian detention centres have access to quality rehabilitation, education and training programs in an effort to reduce uh, instances of reoffending. We want those who have served custodial sentences to return to society with some skills and in better health than when they entered the system, which so often does not happen. And that with the help and support uh, uh, of their families uh, and to be part of our society. The police of the old parties, the policies of the old parties haven't worked. The policies the Greens promote have been implemented in many other jurisdictions around the world and they are evidence-based and deliver better outcomes for everyone. Martin Foley. Yes, you can have a little bit more of a say if you Thank like. Thank you, Kate. Um, so, as we heard from our uh, introduction, the truth of the matter is that uh, over the course of the last uh, four years, crime in the city of Port Phillip has actually come down by 7.4 per cent. Uh, statewide crime has come down by 7 per cent. Uh, that's not us saying it's Independent Crime Stats Agency. Uh, of course, as we also heard, the perception of crime and the reality of people's lived experience is such that uh, it's a hot button issue for all sorts of reasons. And every citizen has the right to feel safe in their community wherever they are. And the truth of the matter is that that is a contested space between dealing both with the consequences of crime and the causes of crime. And you have to walk both sides of that fence at the same time. That's why uh, when we saw a zero net increase in the number of police between 2010 and 2014, this government has committed through a process of uh, arm's length from it linked to the needs of Victoria Police and the processes where the Chief Commissioner sets that, that we have seen 3,000 new police progressively coming online uh, since 2016. 25 police in our own community. Yet at the same time, we also have to take the advice from the police as to where and how they need the tools for modern policing, such as CCTV. The four rollouts of CCTV in the city of Port Phillip have all happened at the recommendation of uh, the uh, commander of police in this area to this government and we have acted on those. At the same time, we also have to act very strongly on the causes of crime, housing, mental health, uh, alcohol and drug addiction, uh, the opportunity for safe and secure support services to get people rehabilitated out of the areas in which uh, they can become vulnerable to crime. And uh, we think that the processes that we have made in each of those areas, most notably uh, uh, as recently as last week with the Mental Health Royal Commission commitment, put us on the path to that. I would close by just commenting on what continues to be the single largest community safety issue in the state, and that is family violence against women and children. Uh, this government had Australia's first Royal Commission into that issue, and the 237 recommendations are all committed to, with over $2 billion worth of funding and change to not just change policing, but the culture of our society to deal with that issue. And I would have used the opportunity to ask the Liberal Party candidate, would he repudiate his party's position of reviewing the evidence uh, of whether they will fund that Royal Commission's recommendations? It was a Royal Commission that found that issue to be the number one community safety issue in Victoria. Thanks, Martin. Tamazin, would you like? Um, 
So human crime is decreasing. The last time anyone looked at crimes against non-humans was in 2014, the Crime Stats Agency. It was under the category of miscellaneous and it was up 26%. And this year we've seen uh, poisoning of wedge-tailed eagles, we've seen people running over emus, we've seen torturing and killing of kangaroos and that's just what's visible. And people are saying that they, that they believe these crimes should be cr prosecuted the same as if someone were to do it to a human being. People who commit crimes against animals commit crimes against humans. There's a graduation theory. So this may touch on sensitive topics, but when we employ people in abattoirs to hurt and kill animals for a living and pay them and then they, to suppress their natural empathy and then they go home to their wives, partners, children, what do we think happens? There's a causal link between people who work in industries that hurt animals and family violence. And we're so concerned about family violence and we have to look at that component of it. We must. <laughs> the, the other thing I that, we're, that we're doing is we want to establish an independent animal protection agency. At the moment, animal welfare laws are porous and meaningless and they're all run by the industries that that depend on hurting the animals for a profit. So it's either under the Department of Agriculture or it's under the live export industry or it's under the racing industry. It has to be independent and it has to be separate. So that's what w one of the main things that we will do if you vote for me. Thanks, Hamilton. Jared, thank you. Um, just you know, uh, continuing on from the points that, that Martin has made on uh, when we're looking at perceptions of crime and we're looking at actual crime rates, a lot of the times uh, when people are perceiving uh, public nuisance or they're perceiving antisocial behaviour, they're perceiving people that are severely drug dependent or people that have untreated mental health conditions. And that's causing this perception of rising crime or disorder in the local community. And the reasons why you may be seeing that in your local community are because firstly, the war on drugs approach has failed. And secondly, that mental health services are inadequately funded. So we need to approach this issue comprehensively. Um, we need to treat drug dependence as a health issue, not a criminal justice issue. Um, increased police is not gonna solve this. Um, and I wanna talk briefly about CCTV as well because we know with the evidence with CCTV, with if it's the kind of crime where people kind of rationally think about their actions, uh, they're, they're likely to be deterred by CCTV. Somebody that is severely drug dependent or somebody that has a serious mental health condition is not gonna be deterred by CCTV. That's a really cheap smoke screen that the parties put out there to try and deal with these issues. What we really need is a safe injecting facility in St Kilda. We need... We need to treat drug issue, drug use and drug dependence like a health issue. And if you're concerned about public nuisance, if you're concerned about people being severely drug affected on the streets, a safe injecting facility is an easy and, and effective and evidence-based way to ensure that there isn't this spillover of dependence onto the streets and people will actually be funneled into the treatment that they need. Thank you. Okay, thank you candidates and thank you very much Selby, that was great. All right, we're moving on to education now and who better to introduce this topic than students themselves. We're very fortunate tonight to have two Year 11 students here from Albert Park College. So please welcome to the stage Jemima Scott and Will Hurley. Hi everyone, my name is Will Hurley and I'm in Year 11. And I'm Jemima Scott, also in Year 11. And we were recently just appointed the position of college captain for 2019. <laughs> Education is something to us that is really valuable and something that we um, are really grateful to have at such an amazing school such as APC. Since 2014, we've seen not only our school grow, but the community grow. And we've seen a need for growth in the community through opportunities. Um, at our school, we're really passionate about the arts, which reflects our motto of lead, create and inspire. It's also seen directly through our contribution, um, our students' dedication, sorry, to music, drama, academia um, and all the, all the departments across education and our contribution to engagement within the community. Um, we can also see through the commitment into our, in the new collabor collaborative um, campus with Victorian College of the Arts and APC, which focuses on the performing arts. 
In schools across the state, and especially in our community, we found um, a wide array of passions that drive schools, whether it's the environment, art, STEM, and various other areas. We see this growth, and we um, start to question how we're going to be able to deal with this growth in the coming years. Especially with a school like ours, we've grown from 150 students in 2011 to currently um, where we have 1,200 students, and we're expected to have about 1,400 in 2020. What my question is, is with this growth, we also see um, students who, well, what we can see at our school is students who have mental health problems um, need to see the psychologist, and there's simply too many students and not enough time for the, with the psychologist. So some students are denied um, access to the psychologist for their mental health problems. What we'd like to see in the future, what we'd like to know is if in the future, how are we going to um, you know, cope with this growth and how we're going to allow students, every student, to be heard and to have a session with a psychologist and with this growth, how they, sorry, <laughs> how the students can um, be, be private about this and not have everyone else knowing about it. So yeah, thank you. And just leading off that, we wanted to discuss what plans and commitments that have been and can be put in place for future growth and demand in Albert Park and surrounding areas. There's, in the past 10 years, been a dramatic change in education, not only in Port Phillip, but in Victoria as a state. Firstly, with the opening of APC six years ago, which has dramatically grown, as Will just explained, and the new development of the South Melbourne Park Primary opening in 2019 and the Fisherman's Bend Precinct. We see this as a great positive movement and a massive commitment for the future of education. However, with this extensive growth in the primary years, comes an increase in commitment for secondary and tertiary education systems in Abbott Park, including Abbott Park College. So we ask, how do you aim to accommodate this for this new upcoming wave of students that will come into our secondary community? Jamara and Will, thank you so much. I think next year's Year 12s are in very good hands. Thank you. All right, candidates, you can have a bit longer to speak to this one so that you can incorporate the things that the students asked. So you can have four minutes each on this topic and Martin, if you'd like to start. Uh, thank you and uh, can I thank these outstanding young leaders of their school for um, the leadership they've shown here. <laughs> and um, well done to Jemima for keeping the family uh, tradition of school captains going after your brother. Uh, when this government got elected in 2014, we set out a bold agenda for investing in not just education in this community, but education around the state. We have delivered 70 new schools, and two of those are in this electorate, uh, the new South Melbourne uh, Primary School in Farrar Street and the two open in, in February next year, the South Melbourne Park Primary School. We also undertook to uh, build and we have delivered two new campuses for Elba Park College. In fact, we've uh, now delivered three with the addition of the Pickle Street campus as well. We undertook to rebuild Elwood College, we did, and we've also added further funding to that for their Stage 2 program, which commences next year. Uh, we've also built uh, just outside of the electorate, but touching in terms of its proposed zone, the top corner of the electorate, uh, the new secondary college in Paran. We've also funded uh, the extensive rebuild uh, in two phases of uh, Port Melbourne Primary School, and if elected, we've committed to the final stage of a further $8 million project there. We've also funded, uh, in this year's budget, a $5 uh, million program for St Kilda Primary School, which uh, is being delivered in the planning stages as we speak, with an election commitment of a further uh, $5.8 million should we be uh, elected for the next stage of their program. We have also funded the redevelopment of the Wesleyan Hall at Albert Park Primary School uh, as the necessary learning space that, physically speaking, one of the smallest um, uh, campuses of a primary school in the state desperately needs to deliver its areas of engagement with its community. We've also undertaken, as Jemima was uh, good enough to point to, that should we be re-elected, we will collaborate with uh, Elba Park College, the Victorian College of the Arts Secondary College, which also sits in the district of Elba Park in the Sturt Street Arts Precinct, and Gasworks to build together a community youth hub that during school hours is able to accommodate um, uh, youth 
performance and uh, development, but after hours forms a uh, part of a rejuvenated gas works to take it to a new level of support as stage one with a $12.5 million commitment there. Add to that uh, further commitments that we've made around uh, surrounding schools and surrounding systems wide places, not the least being a uh, commitment that's in this current budget and is well developed for a secondary college in Fisherman's Bend to go with the uh, hospital funding that we announced yesterday uh, and other uh, open space funding and processes about delivering uh, developer contributions as of March next year into the Fisherman's Bend precinct. That's on the capital side, but as Will uh, touched on, what about the kids in the schools? This government has delivered uh, the first uh, uh, hospital practitioners program into schools, uh, so kids can have primary access to support they need. We've delivered breakfast clubs, we've delivered funding for both equipment and uh, arrangements so no one is left behind when it comes to uh, excursions and trips. And we have also, last week, announced not as an election commitment, a rolled out program commencing next year in this current budget, a $51 million program to make sure that we deliver mental health practitioners uh, in partnership with those primary health practitioners into schools, starting with the most at need and then rolling them out progressively over the next four years to all secondary schools. <laughs> and finally, touching on the issue that was asked of uh, the Liberal Party candidate, uh, is the issue of safe schools and diversity of kids in our community. This government proudly stands by making sure that any gender diverse or same sex attracted kid in our community has access to the resources, because that's what Safe Schools is, it's a resource for schools and school community, it is not a curriculum to be supported in who they are. And if you want to see what the success of that looks like, come with me to Elwood College, meet their school captain, Georgie Stone, a young trans woman who has uh, come to our community because she felt safe here in that, in that development. And Georgie Stone is the young Victorian of the year because she has been supported by her family, her school, and the opportunities that Safe Schools has given her to be who she is, a dynamic, brilliant young woman who will be a leader of our community well into the future. Augie Simic. Augie, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Martin Foley. I agree with uh, much of what you've said, and I certainly believe that education is the premise of all progress. Um, I, my family, have always believed that um, uh, good schools um, build the sort of uh, society, uh, the sort of successful and cohesive society that we need. Uh, one of the things that uh, the Greens are worried about is that uh, Victoria today lags behind the rest of the community when it comes to public funding per student, uh, and the. Premier Andrews and the Labor government unfortunately has continued to throw more money and disproportionately more money at the private sector. Uh, we believe that funding of schools should be based on equality and need with full transparency of funding decisions for schools, upgrades and maintenance and building of new schools. Albert Park is a marginally held seat and one of the things that you see in the lead up to an election is lots of announcements uh, around schools. Um, with the Greens believe that we need to look at the uh, whole state uh, and look at where it needs greatest uh, in order to respond uh, to issues around education. Uh, and disproportionately people in regional cities uh, and regional places uh, are struggling to access the same sort of education uh, that we have here uh, available to us uh, in Albert Park. With the uh, coming online of Fisherman's Bend uh, and 80,000 new people uh, coming into the area, uh, it is uh, absolutely no secret that we need uh, more schools uh, when I go out door knocking and speak to parents uh, and students, they're all telling me that classes are overcrowded and, and becoming more crowded um, and that uh, the uh, ability to send uh, and choose which school to send uh, their students to is becoming a difficult decision for parents. Uh, in respect, with respect to the question around mental health, um, currently one in five children and young people are affected by mental health problems and disorders and uh, transgender, gender diverse students and teachers uh, are particularly vulnerable to stigma and discrimination. Uh, and I was recently contacted on that topic by residents shocked to learn that there are laws uh, that allow faith-based schools to discriminate against students uh, and teachers based on sexuality and gender, and that both major parties had supported these laws and voted to retain them in the past. 
The Greens believe that it is in the best interest of students at faith-based schools that their teachers are employed on the basis of skills and nothing else. Uh, and I encourage that the Labor Party, and the Minister um, spoke to this tonight, uh, has, has since joined us uh, in committing to reform laws to protect staff and students from discrimination. When it comes to TAFE, the Greens are committed to restoring a well-funded system as the leading provider of low-cost, high-quality vocational education and training in Victoria by making sure at least 70% of public funding goes to TAFE. If elected, uh, I will work hard to ensure that all students in Albert Park are afforded the same opportunity to get a high-quality education regardless of their postcode or wealth. Thank you. Thank you. Jared, would you like to... Jared, yeah. Sorry. Um, it, I reiterate some of the points that have already been made, particularly around religious schools being able to discriminate currently and getting a free pass to discriminate. Um, that that should definitely be reformed, and the fact that it's remained on the books for so long is uh, quite shameful, actually, um, against both the major parties. Um, it was interesting to hear uh, that, that the students who, who spoke were interested in, in arts. And it used to be that we, we talked a lot in the past just about STEM subjects and how important they were for the future, but now we talk about STEAM. Uh, because we talk about how important the arts are uh, for career development and for also personal development as well. Um, one, of the, one of the major things that, that Reason wants to support is to actually have equal scholarships uh, that we have for sport for arts uh, so that students... So that Students who are more interested in that area can actually develop fully and we can, we can um, develop those skills in students. Um, in terms of psychologists in schools, I was, I was very happy that there was a psychologist in the school and not just a school chaplain. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I love this idea of, of integrating services into schools, and I think that that needs to be expanded further. So we, we have a, a practitioners in school program, we have a lawyers in school program in one particular area, and I think that should be expanded out fully. Um, another thing that's very important, and it actually leads into our discussions about uh, crime, is actually the importance of speech pathologists in schools. Um, we know there's a really strong link between uh, kids not acquiring language um, as well at a very young age and future antisocial behaviour. And indeed, all the therapies, all the effective therapies that we have for antisocial behaviour rely on a kind of introspection and a degree of language that's so important. So having integrated speech pathologists in schools would not only improve the mental health of students, um, but would also be a, a great intervention for actually reducing our overall crime rates. Thank you. So we are the progressive panel. <laughs> um, I kind of, you know, we support the Animal Justice Party policies and our positions are all grounded in four values. Kindness, equality, rationality, non-violence. So a lot of what's been said, of course we, we support equal treatment for everybody, um, regardless of gender, race, species also. Everyone deserves our respect. Um, and you wouldn't think maybe that we have a policy on education, but the treatment, our attitude toward, towards animals and our relationship with animals affects every aspect of our social, political, economic world. So thinking about psychology and education, schools are somewhere where our young people's values are implicitly moulded in that environment. And it starts at the canteen and it continues in the laboratory. So what we want to advocate for is having plant-based diets in schools teaching kids about nutrition, um, also not uh, finding alternatives. There are great scientific alternatives to dismembering animals in laboratories. We just really don't think it's good to teach kids that as a way to develop empathy. Um, and learning about good nutrition, where, where what we eat comes from. We have this expression, paddock to plate, but there's a middle ground that people don't talk about because we don't like to talk about paddock to truck to slaughterhouse to plate. But we believe that people should know and then they can make an informed decision and they can 
I, I mean, luckily the most ethical diet happens to be the healthiest. It also happens to be the most environmentally sound, so it's a good win for everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and to educate kids on the realities of the animal industries which pervade every aspect of life which, but which typically remain hidden. And one of our jobs really is to illuminate those things because if we don't bring them to light they remain in the dark and people keep doing things that they would never otherwise do if they knew what was going on. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. All right, moving on to our final topic now of arts and culture. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Nicole Bayer, who lives and works in the city of Port Phillip and is also the executive director of Theatre Network Australia. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Kate. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we meet on and pay my respects to elders past and present. Every day when I ride my bike from St Kilda to South Melbourne along the foreshore, I, I'm really grateful that the Boon Wurrung people have looked after this land and it's such a beautiful, beautiful coastline to, to ride along, so I'm grateful for that. And those banks years have been there for tens of thousands of years. Um, the electorate of Albert Park is one of the most culturally rich in the state, if not the country. I did a rough count of arts and cultural organisations just off the top of my head, there were 32 large arts and cultural organisations and there are dozens of smaller organisations and then hundreds of groups that I didn't count. Um, you'll all know Ri Ri Richard Florida, the researcher, um, tells us that a creative city spurs regional economic growth because of innovation. But it's also important that you have creative people living in cities because creative people um, make cities prosper and, and, the ci and cities that don't have creative residents they tend to stagnate the, and this electorate from my back of the envelope calculation has around 10% of the residents here are creative um, workers, work in the creative industries, 10%. But I'm also a fan of art for art's sake, you know, so being able to participate in the arts is a human right and any parent or family member here who's watched a, 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 a young person on stage in a performance or a concert and to see that beaming smile, um, you know that there's something hugely valuable and innate um, in, in knowing that that child has participated in the art and had their small part in that concert. Just really quickly, I thought what I would do is map out those 32 organisations that I counted just to give you a bit of an idea of, of what uh, this electorate has in it in terms of organisations. So there are organisations presenting performing arts, such as the Alex Theatre that we're in today. There's the Palais, there's Theatre Works, there's the National Theatre, there's Art Centre Melbourne, and there's Testing Grounds. Then there's theatre and dance organisations, Melbourne Theatre Company, Malthouse Theatre, Chunky Move, Theatre Network Australia, that's my organisation in South Melbourne. There's the Australian Ballet. In film, there's Acme X. In digital, there's the Arcade. Music, Orchestra Victoria, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, Recital Centre, Music of Viva, Short Black Opera, hundreds of bands and choirs and community music groups. Then there's the educational institutions, Victorian College of the Arts, NIDA in Melbourne, there's a, a NIDA branch here at the Guild. There's ANAM, the National Academy of Music. There's the National Theatre Ballet and Drama School and the Australian Ballet School. In the visual arts, there's the National Gallery of Victoria, the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art, the, the Australian Tapestry Workshop, Linden Gallery, and then many, many smaller galleries, and you can probably call them out, and, and I'm sure that there's more that you all know, and artist-run spaces as well. And then multi-arts, there's Melbourne Fringe Festival, Gasworks Arts Parks, and Kilda Festival, Auspicious Arts, Arts Access, Jewish Museum, AFIDS, Multicultural Arts Victoria. So my question to the panel is I'd, I'd love for them to um, let me know and let you all know what the single most important reason there is, what do they believe is the single most important reason to support arts and culture in Albert Park and then what strategic long-term action will you take to ensure that artists, audiences and arts organisations thrive? Thank you, Nicole. That was great. So candidates, you can have three minutes to address those questions and make some, some short statements uh, of your own about arts and culture in the electorate. We'll start with Augie Simic. Let's do that. 
Thank you, and thank you for the pleasure of starting on this uh, very important topic. As Councillor of City of Port Phillip, I've had the pleasure of working with many of the organisations um, that were outlined earlier. Um, and uh, to answer the uh, first question first, um, the Greens believe that a vibrant, well-resourced and independent arts community is core to any thriving society. Um, so the single most important thing for us to be doing uh, is to, to be supporting our thriving uh, local uh, arts community. Uh, in here in Alba Park, as we heard, we're spoiled with world-class galleries uh, and live entertainment options. Like many people uh, across the country, we were appalled when the New South Wales government, supported by the uh, federal liberals, allowed the Sydney Opera House to be used as a giant billboard, uh, available to the highest bidder, in this instance, racing New South Wales. Imagine if they th tried this uh, on the Palais, um, I thought. The Victorian state government's recent decision to demolish part of Federation Square to build a store for one of the world's richest companies without public consultation was another display of blatant commercialisation being allowed to erode our culture and artistic institutions. <laughs> our public places should be shaped by people, not brands, and the idea that people with power can buy our city is one, of the Greens, uh, is, uh, is one that the Greens will continue to stand with the community to oppose. The art make a valuable contribution to a nation's economy and support to the arts represents an important economic as well as social investment. Recently, I had the pleasure of visiting the Arcade in South Melbourne, Australia's first non-for-profit collaborative workspace created for developers and creative companies. I saw how the games industry, as well as offering a high return on investment, provides important skills that are transferable to other sectors, including design, animation and storytelling. The reverse is also true with opera singers, musicians, programs, uh, landscape uh, artists, writers and voice actors regularly involved in the game development. As well as prioritising Australia's arts and creative industries, the Greens want Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, uh, culture, heritage, including language, knowledge, rituals and stories to be recognised and preserved. While the treaty process has now begun, uh, Greens MP Lydia Thorpe, the first Aboriginal woman elected to the Victorian Parliament uh, is working hard to amplify the voices of elders and the grassroots community to ensure that processes reflect true self-determination uh, and deliver as much needed justice, rights and healing for Aboriginal people. So when we talk about culture and arts, we can't forget to talk about our Aboriginal people. Thank you. It's Martin Foley. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, so what's the single most important issue beyond the celebratory nature of what it is to be human to what it is to celebrate cultural participation and artistic engagement? The single most important issue is how do we identify, fund, nurture and grow independent, small and medium organisations in the arts and cultural sector so as to grow the overall pipeline of cultural participation in our state. And as Nicole indicated, not only do we uh, perhaps uh, bat above the state average, well and truly when it comes to participation because of the rich, uh, small, medium and all the way through to the big cultural players in our community, we actually, according to the Australia Council, have the greatest density in the nation uh, of uh, when it comes to the federal seat of McNamara, of which um, uh, the District of Albert Park sits 100% within. We are the cultural capital of not only Melbourne, but indeed Australia in the District of Albert Park. And if I had to identify the strategic approaches that we need to make the most of that, uh, it is there on the public record now. Uh, this government delivered the first uh, creative industry strategy, a first whole of government, whole of community, cultural participation and economic strategy uh, in place over after an 18-month consultation with uh, over 10,000 people in both face-to-face -face meetings and uh, digital presence right across the state. That policy delivers right across our state, but in terms of this community, what it does is it delivers physically in the different pockets that make us so rich here. At one corner of the community, we have those big cultural precincts where we have uh, put in place with the City of Melbourne the first um, uh, overlay in the planning scheme for the Sturt Street precinct that it now requires any further investment and development there to have at its heart 
uh, for the first four, first four stories of any development are cultural participation and artistic and cultural organisations. Whether it's the organisation that uh, Oggy talked about in South Melbourne, the Arcade, this government funded not only the first arcade uh, in uh, South Bank, but because it grew so fast with the support of the state, it is now the design hub uh, for games and the related gamification benefits that flow from that for the nation, where over half of the games development and therefore design and participation around a whole range of other areas is in South Melbourne as a result of the active leadership of this government and its participation strategies. If you go through South Melbourne uh, to where Nicole's organisation is based uh, with the Tapestry Workshop, ANAM, Arts Access, Multicultural uh, Arts, you've got another hub. Uh, come down to um, St Kilda and you've got a revived live music hub where our $22 million um, uh, program around music works has delivered a million dollars to the direct participation of artists and venues to be able to celebrate our live music culture. And as you go around the corner, you'll see the partnership that we've developed with the $13 million base funding that was able to then lever off the saving of the Palais to make sure that that cultural icon of not just this community but the nation is able to see its way well into its second century. So on all of those measures, this community is well served by not just the participation of the big cultural players, the big cultural institutions, as wonderful as they are, but the grassroots thriving opportunities of which we need to do more for small, medium and independent organisations. Tamazin. So I, I'll just frame this. Um, with, with the Animal Justice Party, we have policies and positions. And policies are what we advocate on. We have a growing number of uh, policies all the time, and they're specifically to do with humans, animals, and the environment, but with animals is the focus. Positions are um, if we are asked to vote in parliament, that we will vote on the basis of those four values, kindness, equality, rationality, non-violence. But we do have positions on things based on those um, values. So in relation to arts and culture, I, I'll speak um, in, in that regard. I'm the child of two actors and, sorry, Pa, I have to say, my father played Pontius Pilate in the original Australian production of Jesus Christ Superstar at the Palais. <laughs> <laughs> So I just had to mention, because it's just a great connection, you know. Look, um, I'm the child of two actors. I have friends who are actors. I've seen uh, the, the value that arts can have in terms of expressing social, historical, political ideas in new and innovative ways that don't happen in any other way. Um, I also have friends who work in the health industry that use the arts to explore um, health and patient treatment and teaching healthcare professionals, so it's incredibly important. Um, it's, it's important for cultural expression as a, um, it, it helps form culture. Um, uh, Aboriginal culture, the traditional laws and customs of this land, the remnants of which are there, I feel it's up to us to, to continue these somehow, to, uh, to learn from them and to carry this forward in a co-created culture. That's really important. Um, so, so we would support any, anything. Our position would be to have um, a full, diverse, robust um, system where we can express arts and culture in our district of Albert Park that includes everybody. Um, just on the, on the importance of art, I, I always like to think about life as kind of experiments in living um, and the great thing about art is it kind of pushes the horizons of the kind of different lives that you can live and the different experiences that you can be a part of. And so I care very deeply about art um, and I like my art kind of weird and wonderful uh, and ensuring our diversity of small and medium institutions in terms of uh, art development is, is so important. Um, it's one of the reasons that Reason's committed to redistributing 1% of the current funding that goes to the major art institutions, things like the NGV, redistributing 1% of that funding to small and medium institutions to ensure a diversity of art is being um, put forward. 
Um, we're also heavily, as I emphasized at the start, an anti-censorship party. Um, and one of the reasons I mention that is when I talk about censorship, people don't really realize that we actually have quite stringent censorship laws in Victoria. Um, a couple of years back, a film uh, in the Melbourne Queer Film Festival was pulled uh, from being exhibited because it had explicit scenes of gay sex. Gosh, um, <laughs> the fact that, that artistic expression uh, can still be censored in Victoria is ridiculous, uh, and we need to reform Victorian laws to the extent that they can in line with federal laws, so more in line with the ACT, to ensure full artistic expression in Victoria. Finally, uh, and another thing that we're the, we're the only party uh, to put forward, uh, and this is kind of a baby of Fiona Patton, our, our leader, uh, leader of the party, Fiona Patton, um, we think that there should be a minister for fashion. Um, and, when I, and when I first put that forward, everyone, everyone does kind of laugh. Um, one of the main reasons is that, that fashion plays, the fashion industry I should say, fashion in general maybe, uh, but the fashion industry uh, plays an important role in the Victorian economy. Um, and when you speak to people who work in that industry, they do not think uh, that the value that that industry has for our community is being dealt with under the current arts portfolio. And so having a dedicated minister for fashion ensures growth in that area and ensures that it actually gets the, the attention it deserves. Thanks. Okay, thanks candidates. We're rapidly running out of time, but let's try and get some audience questions in now. If you submitted questions to the website and haven't heard what you wanted to hear tonight, and or you just want to ask another question, if you could come and line up in the centre aisle, starting at about row K, if you can see row K, and the organisers on the floor will hand you a microphone, which I will grab now, excuse me, and we will try and get through as many questions as we can. Candidates, I'll limit your answers to one minute, please. If you can please also direct your question to a particular candidate, that would be great. Thank you. So if you can state your name. Good evening, candidates. My name's Jen Stone. I've got a, uh, a question, really, that it's most appropriate um, to go to Martin Foley. Um, it's based on the previous session's uh, commentary around what an epicentre for the creative arts um, the seat of Albert Park is. And we all saw with the State Memorial Service for Murkamura, um, what an icon and a much loved treasured figure she was. Um, we've had the memorial service. I'm interested to know if the state government has got any interest in um, developing some more permanent um, institution, facility, thing um, that commemorates Merca's very important uh, relationship and um, place in St Kilda. Um, open to all sorts of thoughts. Um, squashing Merca Moira's contribution to Victoria into a minute will be a challenge. Um, so Merca received, as I understand it, the first state funeral for a woman artist in Australia uh, at the Palais and it was a wild celebration of her creativity. <laughs> Working with uh, Heidi Gallery and um, Merca's family and estate and her many friends, uh, we are putting together a process where in a respectful way, because the family have got a lot of issues to deal with at the moment, uh, we hope a foundation whereby uh, we will be able to not just protect a lot of her current work that uh, was within the responsibility of the family and the gallery, uh, but indeed a foundation that which uh, we're talking to Heidi about how we provide the funding for the business case for that uh, in a way that they can bring that forward to whoever the next government is. Uh, and I hope if we are that government, and if I am that minister, to give that a special um, push along so as to make sure that that foundation or whatever the entity might be that the family and Heidi decide on uh, is one that not just protects the assets and the work that they have in their possession, but also looks to her wonderful public contributions in so many public spaces right throughout Victoria. And I should add, uh, and I take this as an opportunity to announce 
that uh, a fund that the Minister for Women has uh, to memorialise in an appropriate way a, a fund for significant women in Victoria that should that foundation and should the family and should Heidi wish to um, perpetuate the uh, memory of Merca in an appropriate way that uh, a million dollar fund has been established for that purpose and that the Minister for Women, uh, with my full support, will make sure that the Merca Moira commemoration from that fund is the first project that it considers should we be uh, in a position to be re-elected in November 24th. Thanks, Martin. Next question, and if I can just uh, let people asking the questions uh, know that we'll just try and speed up the questions now if you can, so just right. be really succinct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Henk van Leeuwen. Um, I would like to ask um, what will be the future commitment on two things that are very closely interrelated. Affordable, accessible social housing has not really had a go during this discussion this evening. Um, you know, we still are at a situation where only 3.5 or so percent of all housing in Victoria is social housing. That was the case in 1982 when Labour promised to double the proportion as a percentage of all housing. Even with the forward commitments that have been made for the next 20 years, it will still sit at about 3.7, 3.8%. We need to make a very serious inroad. Associated with that is this whole question which was hey, we raised. We need to get your question, please. Thank you. Well, I need to know, you know, what are the, the serious commitment regarding that and also the issue of Airbnb increasingly rental housing should be for renters is being made available for the short stay market it's destroying the situation in St Kilda. Thank you. Martin, can you, Martin? Martin, can you answer that? Um, okay thanks Henk. So when you take government and you've had 335 million dollars taken out of the housing portfolio there is a substantial path back and this government has more than filled that contribute that hole and at the same time when the uh, national partnership arrangements for uh, housing are being trashed by the Commonwealth that makes that even more challenging. Having said all of that this government is determined to do two things uh, and has begun that process. We have uh, uh, a process whereby social housing partnerships with uh, non-government organisations right across the state are uh, being delivered in a way in which we are increasing, not as fast as we would like, but increasing uh, the number of stock of social housing whilst at the same time uh, improving equally the uh, contribution of public housing. And at the same time, uh, if I can pick Augie up with the greatest respect in uh, his uh, earlier comments, we are also renewing housing stock that is disproportionately unlivable, that we condemn a generation of people in 1950s and 60s walk-ups that were uh, not fit for purpose when they were last seriously assessed in the 80s. We need to not just deliver more public housing, we need to deliver it in a different way in which the deep entrenched disadvantage that we condemn particular communities to is diversified into a more uh, widespread set of uh, groups that make sure that we have diverse housing. I could, in the in the minute, it's a bit hard to do with do with all those arrangements. But uh, social housing targets, uh, the introduction of inclusionary housing policies, uh, particularly when it comes to Fisherman's Bend, uh, six percent there, and when it comes to Airbnb. Um, I've run out okay. of time, yeah, but there, there was, time, after so three years uh, mucking around, a piece of legislation that was finally passed at the death knell of the parliament. But uh, I would like to think that uh, if that was given an opportunity to work, it might have prospects. But I fear that uh, in that three year uh, period in which uh, the bill was frustrated in the Legislative Council, the whole sector has got away and we need to uh, look at how that legislation thanks, applies Okay, thanks, Martin. Airbnb. We just need to hear quickly from Augie Simic on this topic as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I've been, uh, I actually wrote into my close uh, to talk about this issue specifically. Uh, it is one of the issues that sets the Greens uh, totally apart from uh, the approach that the Labor Party has taken to housing. And housing is such an important issue because it goes into our discussion around livability, around crime, everything we've talked about. We know that providing people with a home is the first and most important step 
uh, in a, uh, creating a livable society. The truth of the matter is that investment in housing uh, over the term that Labor has been responsible for has been, uh, been a drop in the ocean. Um, we saw the announcement of Housing for Victorians, a billion dollar fund, uh, it was framed. This big announcement, but there's been very little action. Uh, and there's projects, and I, I know I sit on the board of directors for um, Housing First, uh, one of our, our community uh, housing organisations here in Victoria. Uh, we know that there's projects ready to go that the state uh, is not getting behind. Uh, here in Port Phillip, we're at a crisis point because we've seen the closure of the Gatwick, we've seen the closure of the um, Regal uh, that's being redeveloped. We, the Tennyson Street um, uh, social housing is also redeveloping uh, and services are not able to find a place for people to go um, and uh, many people are being sent to backpackers instead. Uh, I will talk about, uh, in the closing, the policy which the Minister referred to, which is uh, the renewal policy, and give my response to that. But I will finish this point by saying that the Greens are the only party that has a plan to end homelessness. Uh, a plan, a fully funded plan, to create 40,000 new public housing spots and 40,000 new social um, community housing spots in Victoria. The reality of the matter is that there is 84,000 people currently living uh, and waiting for public housing on the wait list uh, for emergency accommodation. The wait sometimes up to 20 years for those people. We need to take this issue seriously. Uh, the Labor government has failed to do that. Uh, the Liberal government um, has definitely failed to do that. Um, and it's something that the Greens take incredibly seriously. Thanks, Oggy. Okay, next question, please. Thank you. Kay O'Connor from Junction Area Action Group. My question is to Minister Foley. Uh, and Greens can answer if they choose. Uh, it's about planning, transport and livability for one of our oldest intersections, St Kilda Junction, where the Labor Party last week announced about um, bike paths through St Kilda Road, um, at the northern end to have Central, at the southern end at St Kilda Junction to have Copenhagen. What is your plan for the transition from Central to Copenhagen Star at the junction. What is your plan to bring the two tram stops at the junction up to comply with DDA? And what is your plan for walkability at the junction, which currently is unsafe? Uh, thanks, Kay. Uh, so you're right, last week, the government committed a $26 million um, capital program to uh, from Carlisle Street to um, the NGV, uh, dedicated bike lanes. Copenhagen on the side lanes, as they're so called, from Carlisle Street to the junction, and then central lanes, either side of the tram track, from the junction uh, through to the NGV, uh, with the Carlisle Street project starting first. The obvious um, big issue in the middle of that is how you get through not just the junction but equally uh, the domain metro station, metro one station there. So in that respect, um, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a traffic engineer and I've sat with the council, I've sat with um, the bicycle network and I've sat with Vic Roads and I've sat with the Port Phillip Bicycle Users Group and others as to how do you get through that mess of St Kilda Junction in a safe way for a dedicated bike arrangement. And the shorter answer is that I don't know. I will take the expert advice of all of those groups when this project uh, starts to roll out beginning next year to get those very issues. In terms of DDA compliance and the wider issues of the strategic approach, of course, which JAG has long championed, I do note your success in convincing both Council and the Minister for Planning uh, in recent times for uh, that strategic planning approach to review that. Uh, and I am confident that uh, my friend, particularly the member for uh, the uh, candidate for Paran, uh, will have something to say in the very near future about how the strategic arrangements uh, for delivering on that planning scheme amendment uh, will be uh, put in place and it would be wrong for me to uh, steal all of his hard work in this area. Okay, Augie Simich, quickly, thank you. Thank you, Kay, for uh, all of the work that you do um, for our community and um, you often um, come to us at, at council meetings and I, I know and I share your concern for the area that you talk about. Um, I, am, I was very heartened to see the announcement from the Labor Party for the bike paths. It's something that the Greens have been calling for uh, for a, a long time now. Um, we believe that in order to solve the problem that you're talking about, and that intersection is very dangerous uh, when I ride through there, 
Um, I very often, and I think many of us have to close our eyes and just hope for the best. Uh, we really uh, need a solution for that. And the way we find that solution is by working with the community and consulting with the community. Um, I know that the community didn't have an opportunity to provide feedback, uh, the central bike lanes. Uh, and one of the issues with the central bike lanes is that uh, it's very difficult to know how people are going to get on and off. Um, and that, uh, that change in traffic uh, at the junction between the separated, uh, between the central bike lanes uh, and the Copenhagen style lanes uh, is, is something we definitely have to address and the Greens are right behind that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. My name's Jane. Uh, my question, I won't repeat the premises of it, I know you've read it. Um, Melbourne Sports and Aquatic Centre, its uh, stated vision focusing on professional and elite athletes and its pricing structure which favours the financially elite. Um, so my question is, uh, firstly, what will you do about that elitism? Um, and secondly, the expansion plans to expand MSAC, to put more buildings into Albert Park, um, what is your position in relation to that? Can we start with Martin and perhaps the other um, candidates would also like to answer the question? Uh, thanks, Jane. So the Melbourne Sports and Aquatic Centre uh, has a charter going back to its origins to both deliver community and um, uh, semi-elite and elite arrangements. We charge it with that responsibility and some two million members of the wider community visit it every year. Uh, and um, I understand the criticisms that are made about how from time to time that focus uh, might need hauling back, but there is no more visited facility within the city of Port Phillip and the district of Albert Park than the, uh, that uh, whole park area. The fact that it was uh, ever carved out of Albert Park Reserve in the first place uh, is one of the great tragedies of how you get an integrated approach to that park's management. But it is what it is and now it's wider State Sports Centre Trust management role which extends to Parkville and other locations. It has to manage its way through both community and uh, elite and semi-elite participation and the efforts that uh, the board and particularly the directions given to the board are key in that and I'm confident that that will happen in terms of, and is happening, in terms of uh, what MSAC's vision might be uh, at a board level, the, the, the truth of the matter is it does not control those precincts outside of uh, the MSAC boundaries and that they fall within Parks Victoria and um, discussion papers at the board level can be uh, empire grand building all they want. They're not funded, they're not the agency. Parks Victoria continues to be the agency uh, responsible for all those other facilities and uh, I am confident that um, uh, MSAC's grand plans, as important as they need to look to their own backyard, uh, don't extend outside of their boundary and that uh, the areas that you referred to in your tabled question uh, might be um, MSAC's um, not even wish that their vision, but it is uh, not only undeliverable, it won't be able to be delivered because it's not the agency in control of that particular land, that is Parks Victoria. I will just add um, that um, health and recreation is uh, obviously an important part uh, of a livable community. Uh, one of the concerns that people in the community have come to me uh, with is that it's unaffordable for them to go to the pool at MSEC and to use uh, the facilities. Uh, I think uh, as a society we have to look at solutions um, to provide people with the opportunity to use facilities like that so that facilities aren't locked out uh, just for the few uh, but are available um, for all of us. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll have to move on. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Toby. I'm a volunteer with the Port Phillip State Emergency Service and this is a question to the entire panel. Mm -hmm. uh, tonight we've spoken about you know, livability and uh, public safety, uh, especially around the increase of numbers. Uh, in 18 months, the Port Phillip unit uh, is looking like we are going to be out of a LHQ or local headquarters, which is our operating base. Within the, the Old Park Precinct, we have two, sorry, three fire stations, three police stations, two Ambulance Victoria stations, and one SES headquarters with 25 members. If you were to be elected or your party was to be elected, what would be your plan 
or what would you do to help the volunteers that help the, uh, the people of Elbert Park? Augie Simic, would you like to address that first? Yep, sure. Martin Foley. Uh, can I thank Toby and all the other volunteers at Elba Park SES. Uh, uh, SES are at the front line when it comes to our response to floods and particularly to road accidents. And uh, as we've seen, particularly uh, at now just outside the district of Elba Park, but um, Elwood Canal in particular and the precinct there, they are very busy volunteers. But their bread and butter is that process of responding to particularly road trauma and other, um, other uh, accident situations. Uh, so if, if you didn't know, the SES is, is screwed away between the Northport, uh, Port Melbourne football ground and the Australia Post site down there in Williamstown Road. That is in the uh, Fishman's Bend development zone and it's on land that is Crown land managed by the City of Port Phillip. And for some time now, there's been lots of rumours and suggestions that as part of the Fishman's Bend development process that um, the SES is going to have to find a new home. I think the SES has to find a new home anyway because the demands on it as a result of the growing community expectations uh, of the work that the SES has in our community ha have left that particular site behind. And I commit to work with the SES and uh, with the council uh, and more importantly with the Fisherman's Bend Development Board that um, should the uh, processes that the council have in place and that uh, the prospects of development at the uh, Fisherman's Bend precinct uh, require the SES to move, that it move into a fit for purpose, dedicated facility uh, that meets its needs within the city of Port Phillip. Now whether that's in the Fishman's Bend precinct or elsewhere uh, is a question of judgment. We've stopped creating new land in uh, the district of Elba Park and I would guess by uh, the way in which projects are being developed that the new home would probably have to be down that end of town somewhere uh, but um, I'm not in a position to nominate exactly where and I'm not aware other than lots of rumours that um, uh, the SES has actually been uh, given a time frame in which uh, it has to relocate. But rest assured we cannot exist without the SES in this community. Do either of you want to ask? Thank you. Um, I, I have to say that this is not an issue um, that I uh, have uh, as much information on. Um, I believe that volunteers are uh, absolutely a, a backbone uh, to our community and absolutely support the work of the SES. We recently had emergency services come out to a farm when one of our uh, cabins was on fire uh, and that really uh, renewed my uh, commitment to make sure that emergency services are properly funded uh, in the state. Uh, the issue, uh, as I said, I'm not uh, completely uh, across, uh, but let's meet and discuss it. Um, I'm available tomorrow if you'd like. Um, I'd like to uh, learn more about it and find out from you um, how we can help. Thank you. Thanks, Augie. All right, I'd ask that no more people join the queue and we'll try and quickly get through these, say, five questions. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Jared, would you like to... Oh, the, similar to Oggy, I, I mean, I, I uh, would need to be consulted in further about what that issue is and how we can better support it, but for generally reason does obviously support um, emergency services and uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested in hearing more would be my point on that. I, I guess it's similar. <laughs> I mean, but, but possibly more so because I worked in the emergency services, I volunteered with the SES, New York City Medical Reserve Corps, a former paramedic here. <laughs> And I like being out there. Uh, and I think it's critical. I'd love also to know more about it and how we can support the SES. Next question, thank you. Hi, I'm Sue. My question is uh, primarily for Oggy Simic and Martin Follett, but the rest of the panel too. It's on public transport. Um, we live in Port Melbourne and I've been catching the buses to the South Melbourne Market and Vic Victoria Market. Uh, while it runs well during the week, there's none at the weekend. I don't think the 236 doesn't run at the weekend. Um, but by travelling on the bus, I've been talking to other travellers and the older, elderly, frail but still mobile people find it really hard because you have to step off the curb to wave down the bus. And I know I've had to do that and I've had to chase a bus with a fully loaded Jeep, which isn't easy. And um, so the elderly have that as a problem and they miss a bus. And then I found out that the buses can start 
can arrive five minutes or ten minutes early and they don't have to stop or they don't, they don't have to wait. Um, they only stop if someone's at the bus and waves them down. Um, that aspect, I can get to the number one tram in Albert Park. It's great. It goes every ten minutes. What about Garden City and Port Melbourne? They, I don't think they have that good a public transport service running then and a lot of the people in Garden City are the older original um, residents. Uh, one other thing that came up from another lady who was in a... Okay, if we can have your question, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so if you'd like to talk about the frequency of services in the general... I was on a bus uh, last week between St Kilda and Port Melbourne, the bus that um, you're referring to, and I was the only person uh, on the bus, uh, and it was just after five o'clock when I thought the bus would be uh, at its busiest. Um, the Greens uh, have announced a, a plan um, for us to look at the bus um, services across Victoria uh, and upgrade them, in particular in busy areas uh, where there is no uh, tram or train uh, access. Um, we uh, have an absolute commitment to setting up a, an integrated uh, transport strategy for Victoria uh, by first of all creating a transport super agency which brings in all of the different uh, agencies working on transport across Victoria, and there's so many. Uh, one of the things that we see a piecemeal approach to uh, transport, particularly in the lead up to elections when election promises are being made. Uh, the Greens think that we need to bring all of this together uh, through the super agency, uh, look at uh, our future, uh, have an integrated transport for Victoria that uh, doesn't just uh, improve things in the short term, but has a long term strategy for transport in Victoria. Uh, thanks, Sue. I think you're talking about the tram, uh, the buses from Port Melbourne to the city, uh, and there's a couple of them, and they've uh, been rescheduled and rerouted in recent times with an expansion of service arranged around that. The trouble our buses have, um, not just in, on that route, not just in inner Melbourne, but across our uh, city and indeed the state, but particularly the city and particularly the inner city, is that they have to share the roads with uh, increasing congestion. That's why get making sure that we shift as much of our public, of our uh, infrastructure funding into those heavier forms of be it uh, Metro 1, the planning for Metro 2 and the uh, expansion of our tram services is so critical, not just for the mass movement of 5 million people around our city that they will bring, but the integrated nature of how our expanded bus services, which have been expanded quite substantially over the last four years uh, across metropolitan Melbourne, uh, can be integrated into that space. And the infrastructure that goes with that, particularly uh, in areas like Port Melbourne, which has an ageing population around Garden City that you correctly identify, how that then gets linked into both that area and given the growth that we're um, likely to see in Fishman's Bend, how those bus services to both the University of Melbourne campus that starts coming out of the ground next year and then back through the older areas of Port Melbourne is critical and in a minute I can't get much more out of that than that. But I'm happy to have a chat um, about what that might mean for Sue and others. You're all good. Okay, great. Next question, thank you. Hi there, my name is Bryce Baker. I'd like to address my question to the whole panel, but maybe starting with the two candidates who haven't had much uh, airtime during this Q&A session. Um, I want to raise this because I feel that mental health has kind of fallen by the wayside in this election. I and most of my family suffer from major depressive disorder. Um, and while I really welcome Labor's announcement of the Royal Commission, um, I'm really concerned that looking at the speed of other Royal Commissions, it's going to be years and years and years before we see any actual action. So considering the fact that we have the mental health minister here and the ALP and the Greens have dominated parliament in the last four years, uh, but Victoria still spends less per person on mental health than any other state, what message do you have to people like myself and the hundreds of thousands of other people that suffer from mental health issues in Victoria? Jared, would you like to begin? Um, I think that's a great question, um, and Reason wants to prioritise mental health as an issue. Um, as to whether or not the Royal Commission is, is an appropriate way of handling mental health services, I, I, a review of mental health services, I've had a lot of people uh, speak to me who work in mental health who are not happy with this process um, because they see that they're likely to see themselves dragged before hearings and being humiliated for uh, things that are actually the fault of uh, inadequate funding. 
Um, the reason that our mental health services uh, haven't been uh, um, uh, undertaken adequately, the reason why wait times uh, are so long uh, and people fall by the wayside uh, is because of lack of funding. Uh, a Royal Commission is not going to establish or identify anything that we don't already know in terms of inadequate mental health, uh, so it is going to de delay it further. Um, I, would, I would rather, if we were going to have some sort of broad uh, consultation process in place, that something like a parliamentary inquiry uh, would be much more simpler and we would get that expert perspective without a long drawn out process and so that we can fund services in need now. Thank you. Thank you. Tamazin? So we have a mental health policy actually and, and it recognises the beneficial impact on human health of positive, constructive, nurturing relationships with other species. And there was a, an article, a recent article in The Big Issue just about that, about the connection between uh, humans and other species and how valuable it is. Um, there's a lot of research in psychology and mental health to, to show how supportive relationships um, can um, improve people's mental well-being. And those are kind of things that we can do straight away before the Royal Commission gets up, before those kind of top-down approaches. Um, the, other th the other thing I know about is that there's been research done with prisoners looking after puppies and um, elderly people looking after chickens and things like that, and they've found extraordinary benefits for both, for the animals and also for the humans. I'd like to see those kind of experiments. Uh, thanks, Bryce. And doing this in a minute is a real challenge. But Bryce, you and your family are the like everyone else. One in two of us over the course of our lives are going to have a mental illness that we have to deal with. One in five of us every year have a mental health challenge that we're going to have to deal with and a mental illness that we're going to have to deal with in the course of each year. Our mental health system is actually doing what it was designed to do and has been funded to do. Its design and its funding is inadequate. Over the last four years, this government has increased by 181% the funding into our mental health system. And again, it's a pity that the Liberal Party candidate isn't here because between 2010 and 2014, particularly following the botched recommissioning of mental health and alcohol and drug services, fewer people received community mental health services uh, in Victoria in 2014 than they had the previous year. What we need to do is have a root and branch fundamental reimagining of how our uh, mental health system works. And it, with greatest respect, doesn't have to be an inquisitorial hold up the world Royal Commission. I would point you to the Family Violence Royal Commission a collaborative, community-based process that did not seek to apportion blame to anyone, that kept funding going in an interim way whilst the final recommendations were delivered. And that is the kind of model that we can bring the highest level of scrutiny that our system provides into a system where once a generation ago, Victoria led the nation. We're now, as a result of over a generation of underinvestment, uh, decisions that have constrain the system, whether it be from the early intervention, the education, let alone the acute end of the system, let alone um, uh, alcohol and drug measures, we have seen this issue being one of the major drivers of not just social dislocation, social disadvantage, but community trauma right across our state. And the Royal Commission that the Andrews Labor Government is committed to I hope, and I know if we're in a position to deliver it, will be based on the model of the Family Violence Royal Commission and not be the kind of excuse to delay. As we heard already, we're already investing in things like school programs, in things like alcohol and drug and residential rehabilitation beds. We have more than doubled the numbers in the last four years from 200 to over 400. And I could keep going, but I've run out of, I've already exceeded my minute well Thanks, and truly. Uh, thank you, and let me start by first of all um, uh, saying a, a big thank you for the announcement around the Royal Commission uh, into Mental Health. I think it is uh, overdue, uh, and the terms of reference, I agree, we need to work on closely, and hopefully community will have some input into that as well. Victoria spends less on mental health per capita than any other state in Australia. 
Victoria is the only state, and I support the NDIS, the Greens uh, fought for the NDIS um, to be one of the measures that the federal government uh, took uh, and, and legislated for. Um, but Victoria is the only state that put all of its uh, money into the NDIS transition. Um, and unfortunately, many people who access mental health services will not be, will not be currently eligible uh, under the NDIS. Um, the government went backwards on that after community pressure, particularly from Community Mental Health Association, announced $75 million um, to fund the core services, which is less than was there before. Um, and the problem is that so many more people uh, are going to be falling through the gap. Um, I spoke to Patrick from First Step a couple of weeks ago as well, and he said, show me a person uh, with substance abuse, and I'll show you uh, a person um, that has experienced trauma at one point in their life. So we need to be investing in mental health. Uh, we need to be leading the nation, um, and the Greens have a plan to do that, starting by supporting community mental health and our frontline services. You can for I 30 feel seconds. There's a little bit Thank of you. misrepresentation there. So, what Augie was talking about in the NDIS world was the 2014 bilateral heads of agreement signed by the Napthine government uh, with the uh, then federal government about how services, funded services, are transferred to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. All of those services, agreed to by the former government and inherited by this government, are in the process of being transferred to the National Disability Insurance Scheme with the money. The money and how the NDIS has been botched by the Commonwealth is the real issue there. And this government, having spent hundreds of, transferred hundreds of millions of dollars to the Commonwealth to, di to, um, to distribute those services, is being let down as a result of that arrangement. And with those uh, non-government organisations, we have stepped in, in addition to the money that is going to the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, a $75 million package to plug those gaps whilst we now continue to need to put the pressure on the Commonwealth to deliver its commitment to the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which I see further is being eroded uh, in the weeks just gone by as we've seen money taken from the Building Australia Fund that was meant to go to the National Disability Insurance Scheme, some $3 billion, now being used, no doubt, for good reasons for our, our farmers and drought response. This is a very complicated area. A Royal Commission that brings the highest level of scrutiny whilst continuing to invest in this area is, is the only way in which we're going to solve this major community crisis. Thanks, Martin. Okay. Next question. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Peter Craig. I'm a concerned and interested citizen. I have two questions, both are related. The first is, um, when planning and development disputes come before VCAT, the whole system seems weighted in favour of the developer. They have time and resources on their side and VCAT appears to operate largely as a rubber stamp to allow developments to proceed with little consideration given to community concerns or even heritage overlays. Do you or any future government that you may participate in have any plans to reform the way VCAT operates and rebalance the system away from inappropriate development? And the second question, which relates to that, is the proposed redevelopment of one half of Church Square in Ackland Street, St Kilda as a childcare centre has generated over 110 objections to COP and well over 400 signatures on a petition to council. Are you aware of the issue and would your government financially support an alternative proposal that ensures heritage values are supported and generates income for the parish? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to start uh, on that. Thank you for the question and for being a concerned citizen that's come here uh, to speak with us um, tonight. Uh, on the issue of planning, uh, as a city councillor, uh, this is an issue that I'm constantly pulling my hair out uh, over. Uh, it is one of the reasons I've put myself uh, for uh, state uh, parliament uh, because the planning schemes uh, uh, set by the state government uh, it then needs to be implemented by local council. So often decisions which are inappropriate uh, and decisions which are inconsistent with the planning scheme which go to VCAT uh, or the minister uh, are, are later approved. Uh, it, it's a problem uh, and it's a problem that stems as a result of uh, property developers uh, being uh, sorry, the other way around, um, uh, uh, property, uh, uh, the major political parties uh, being prop, prop, uh, propped up uh, by property developers. Uh, it's one of the big issues and one of the things that has to change uh, and uh, is one of the reasons that as a Greens candidate um, I don't take any, um, 
any funding from property developers. On the question of uh, Church Square, uh, it's an issue that uh, needs to be resolved with communi community consultation in mind. Uh, I acknowledge uh, and uh, respect that the actual uh, lands owned by the church, uh, and as a result, um, what the church wants to do with the land has to be taken into consideration. Um, but I think, given the recent um, decision by Heritage Victoria, that there is an opportunity for the community and the church to come together uh, and work towards resolving that particular issue. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter. The Planning Environment Act, which sets the planning framework, including how VCAT operates, is an extraordinary complex piece of legislation that has been amended multiple times uh, since it was introduced in the early 80s. Uh, how that next set of iterations around making sure community voice and particularly local government voice uh, is reflected is really important. And again, uh, it's, uh, that comes up periodically and every time it comes up, I can assure you it's fiercely debated both within the parliament and uh, within um, the Labor Party caucus and when it's government, the Labor Party, um, Party uh, caucuses uh, around the cabinet table. In terms of uh, a commitment to making sure the community voice and the particular role of local government is central to that, it's not just how the Act is framed and how VCAT operates, it's how those wider powers are delivered. And uh, you've got, a, you've got a, a case in point of two approaches over the last two parliaments. You can have the 2010 and 2014 planning minister's approach of rapid uh, redevelopment and rezonings such as Fisherman's Bend and the uh, proudly Mr Skyscraper tag that he gave himself or the much more judicious and um, sophisticated approach in a complicated world that the current Minister for Planning, Richard Wynne, has developed with a fraction of the call-ins and the use of the powers that are available to him. The VCAT process does need continue uh, reiteration and I would certainly undertake that. In terms of Church Square, I'm well and truly aware of it. I got invited on a number of occasions to meet with the uh, informal community group that's come together with that and they asked me to speak to uh, the Anglican Church, which I did. I had a very long conversation which, with the Archbishop for uh, Melbourne on the issue. Uh, and whilst we welcome the Heritage Victoria decision to protect the last remaining church square in Melbourne, uh, intact church square, all the others have been progressively carved up, uh, the, there are many, many issues to still go in that, that space. Uh, I think the issue that you've hit on is going to be a real test for how community and church want to act in a way that puts the aspirations of community at its heart. I fear that the uh, church will um, quietly back uh, the, the childcare provider in its appeal to um, um, the Heritage Council, uh, but I uh, look forward to community, council and all of us supporting uh, that uh, decision to be defended at the Heritage Council and certainly uh, I've already begun discussions with uh, the Minister for Planning about respecting that process and respecting that decision, what kind of uses that are appropriate to that historical, really important heritage site that can be protected to allow it uh, to be remained intact rather than be carved off uh, in the process that uh, the church is currently contemplating. Thanks, Martin. All right, we'll have to move on. The next question, please. And just one question only, please. Thank you. My name is Pete. Uh, everything we've talked about tonight, we've also added the word funding. Now, the Grand Prix costs us $80 million a year. Do you want that $80 million to fund health, education, whatever? Which one of you has the guts, if they're elected, to stand up in Parliament and say, let's get rid of this bloody Grand Prix? All right. Jared, do you have a position on that? Um, we don't have a particular single position on the Grand Prix, but we do uh, talk about uh, ensuring that, that taxpayers' money is being used uh, in the most effective way possible. And I agree with you. If there is a good case that uh, no longer funding the Grand Prix uh, would save the government a substantial amount of money, and that money can go to mental health services, if I can see that, that case put before me, I would absolutely support it. Thanks. 
I live around the corner from the Grand Prix. I've been protesting it since the yellow ribbons. Um, it, 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 the ducks and the birds and the children and the grown-ups and everybody suffers as a result of it. Business owners suffer as a result of it. I think we should start saying it without the French accent. <laughs> um, the price of uh, uh, collegiate decision making is you have to be in the room. And if you want to be in the room, you have to be in a process that brings with it collective uh, cabinet solidarity and processes around how that works. I have been a uh, fierce critic internally and I will continue to be a fierce critic internally of the return to Victorians uh, that the Grand Prix brings. And whilst it was some time ago, the only objective piece of information we have in that space uh, is an Auditor General report that continues to be, I think it was 2008 um, or seven. that continues to be, if you like, the document that processes, uh, even though it's some 11 years old now, uh, those, those relative cost-benefit analysis. Uh, I will continue to prosecute that case in every opportunity that gives me, whilst making sure that um, this community uh, has a seat at that t collective decision-making um, table so as to make sure that the wider benefits that we expect our politicians to deliver us uh, are being delivered. I uh, have the pleasure of being with a party that uh, is uh, fully committed to uh, not have the Grand Prix uh, in uh, Albert Park um, and uh, indeed in Victoria and the Greens have uh, spoken about this uh, in so many instances uh, throughout uh, their time in Parliament. Uh, one of the real opportunities uh, this election is for there to be uh, an um, instance uh, where the Greens are balancing power. Um, and uh, both in the lower house and the upper house. And this is uh, an important and historic opportunity uh, where you will see that issues like the Grand Prix will be prosecuted uh, and that the Greens will fight to try and ensure uh, that money is not spent on the Grand Prix, but that it's all about choice. We've got to look at uh, all of the different things we've talked about tonight. Uh, we talked about housing at length. We can either put money uh, in housing uh, or we can prop up property developers. Uh, there's so many instances where uh, we've got to make that choice um, and hopefully uh, that's one of the things that um, uh, you think about tonight um, as we conclude this debate. Okay, our final question. Thank you. My name is James Woollett. The Greens Party Arts and Cultural Her Heritage Policy Principle 11 states libraries, museums and other collecting institutions are essential repositories of cultural heritage and must be maintained and developed. Yet, on the 15th of November 2017, at the Port Phillip Council meeting, Councillor Simic moved a motion to remove the physical collection of books from Middle Park Library. The motion was passed with the support of all the Greens and Labour Party councillors. In the light of these actions, in defiance of their party's official policies, what are the candidates' real policies to support smaller local libraries in Victoria? Okay, so Mitch. Uh, I feel, uh, thank you James for coming. I feel like this question was directed at me for some reason. Uh, so uh, I, I'll, I'll go on to explain. Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, ca all councillors were provided uh, with a report uh, by officers uh, which looked at the Middle Park Library as the most uh, underused library in uh, all of the city of Port Phillip, the, the collection of five libraries. It accounts for something like 1% of all the borrowings uh, across uh, our municipality. Uh, it's very close uh, to Albert Park Library, um, uh, I think about a, a kilometre's uh, journey. Uh, one of the uh, things that we were presented with is an opportunity to uh, create uh, a arts um, and um, a creative design space uh, as part of the Middle Park Library. Uh, all of the original library services would have stayed. Uh, it was an opportunity for us to uh, make sure that, for example, we have the design software that so many young designers uh, aren't able to purchase themselves at a library that they can come uh, and use. Uh, we then heard very strongly from the community that this is not what people wanted uh, and as a result 
uh, I moved, uh, in fact, um, James, you, the motion that you put to council um, for us to see. The problem with Middle Park Library was that there was a, an underinvestment over time. As a result, the library was struggling, something different had to happen. I moved the motion which you presented uh, for us to invest uh, deeply in uh, Middle Park Library uh, to give it a new lease of life. Uh, and in fact, it was only uh, the Greens councillors that supported that. Um, I'd be very clear that the policy which is set out uh, as a principle uh, in our policy document is, is one that I believe in deeply, uh, that we have to have libraries as a creative space for our community uh, and something I believe in deeply. Uh, thank you, James. The death of the book and the death of the library have been greatly exaggerated. Um, we have seen libraries in our um, state, in our nation and in our comparable jurisdictions around the world thrive. Uh, whether that be the State Library of Victoria, now the fourth most visited library in the world, uh, or whether it be spaces that we've seen in some suburbs and in some regional communities, it's about building out from the core values of what library as a civic democratic space can be. The book uh, is at the heart of that. Uh, and with that goes the wider opportunities for new forms of engagement, whether that be the digital area, whether that be the design space arguments, whether that be opening up to partnerships with all sorts of groups, schools, um, early childhood education centres, um, aged and youth 3As, a whole range of rich, diverse groups, new and emerging communities. Uh, we are seeing partnerships and different uses of civic spaces such as libraries right across Melbourne, right across the world being reimagined. Uh, and it's that imagination that goes to the heart of how these kind of spaces become not just repositories for books, but civic democratic places that allow communities to thrive in all of those creative spaces that we were talking about early and build that social glue that makes us the kind of community that we can continue to be, uh, as we've seen in lots of measures, are some of the most livable communities in the most livable city in Australia. All right, that brings to a close our questions. There are many, many more questions on the website, so we do invite our candidates, if they would like to provide answers to any of those other questions on the website, to do so, and the organisers will be more than happy to post those answers at forum.org.au. All right. We'll give you now each two minutes to close, so give us your best. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. All right, well, you've got a whole array of progressive parties to vote for, clearly, as you've got a whole panel of them in front of you. Um, and so I think what, what your vote ultimately comes down to is uh, the message that you want to send. Um, if you, like me, care very deeply about drug law reform, uh, care very deeply about evidence-based approaches to criminal justice issues and reducing antisocial behaviour, uh, believe in accountable religion, believe in a transparent political process and the, the sex, drugs and rock and roll bit, letting adults be adults. Uh, if you believe in those values, through your vote, you can send a message that those are the kinds of policies that you want to see um, and those are the kinds of actions that you want the government to take. You live in a community that has uh, suffered through uh, a lot of poor thinking in relation to particularly drug dependence, as well as mental health and homelessness. Uh, one of the, the clearest things that you can do this election is to send a message to the major parties through your vote that that is your number one priority. And that's why I suggest that you vote for reason and vote for me. Thanks. So considering all policies, as I mentioned earlier, because we feel we live in a human bubble, but um, all of our policies affect everybody, but often summarily dismiss the rights and interests of 99.98% of those who are affected by the policies and only look after the 0.02%. We're just saying consider everybody. The greatest change for anim animals will be achieved through the parliamentary system and we don't have a seat at the table yet. We need one seat at the table to, to bring the issues that animals face, which are huge, into parliament. Our campaigns, what we will do, we will finish live export, we will free... <laughs> Thank you. 
We will free, ca free hens from battery cans, battery cages. <laughs> Stop duck hunting. Stop jumps racing and whips on horses. I'm sorry, Martin, but we don't agree with your donation to greyhound racing. We want to stop that. And also the kangaroo killing as well. The other thing is your vote will help us establish an independent animal protection agency. It's not an independent office of animal welfare. We're the only party putting that forward. It'll provide a robust system of protections to actually end animal cruelty, not just reduce it. We want to finish it. Um, it'll also increase penalties for animal cruelty. At the moment, uh, no one's prosecuted. Um, look, give us a chance. Um, if you vote one for the Animal Justice Party, you can vote two for your favourite major party and your vote will essentially count twice, thanks to our preferential voting system. I really want a chance to finish animal cruelty and with your vote, we can do it. Um. Can I end by thanking the uh, organisers of tonight's um, event and uh, the uh, effort that you've all put in and for you coming out to do the hard work of democratic accountability and participation and um, uh, sadly note that um, uh, the alternative party of government uh, has decided to be elsewhere for whatever reason and I don't begrudge him it's his birthday but um, the, the price of public participation is Sadly, a lot of what goes for your normal life goes out the door. Uh, and in that respect, uh, this has been a fantastic opportunity to yet again be held accountable to our community. This coming election is about how a government that came to office four years ago set out a bold, visionary plan and has not just ticked off all of the commitments that it made, not just in this community but around the state, uh, it has delivered an outcome that has seen Victoria not just the economic powerhouse, uh, not just the jobs powerhouse, but the socially progressive capital of Australia, whether it come to uh, our commitment to renewables, our commitment to social policy change, our commitment to LGBTI equality, our commitment that we've seen in social policy space like voluntary assisted dying. I could go on, but what we have now is an even bolder, more um, visionary plan for how we're going to deliver, whether it be in education, in public transport and infrastructure, in jobs and the future creation of many of the issues that we've dealt with here today, housing, social housing, cultural and artistic um, pursuits, uh, the creative sector and the kind, of, the kind of society that when we're not here, that we can say proudly that we made a contribution to making Victoria and the uh, District of Albert Park a better, fairer, sustainable, more decent human scale place. And that's the kind of vision that I bring as part of an Andrews Labor Cabinet to those discussions and I would like to think that that's the kind of um, delivery of projects and working with community that I will continue to, if I be given the honour of being, uh, continue to be your Member of Parliament in this uh, next Parliament, those kind of values, those shared, deep, community, democratic values that reflect the best of who we are as a society and that reflect when Labor is at its best, the kind of society that Victorians support. So I look forward to the opportunity of the next uh, three and a bit weeks to test those processes and to make sure that you, the people of Albert Park, have all of those issues and all of those choices before you. And of course, we all respect that democratic process and the choices you make. Thank you. <laughs> Firstly, uh, a big thank you. It's been, it's been a very long night. Thank you to everyone who is still with here, here with us uh, tonight. Uh, I started uh, my presentation and speech tonight by mentioning that we're at a tipping point uh, where public opinion uh, is turning uh, and we're seeing that tipping point here in, in Melbourne. Uh, there's several issues which uh, we haven't probably discussed uh, enough tonight. Um, we did talk about family violence, but we didn't recognise that one of the biggest causes of family violence uh, is gambling and, and pokies. Um, the Greens are the only political party that is taking a policy to this election uh, to phase out uh, gambling and pokies in Victoria. We also have to stop uh, uh, the donations from uh, property developers, uh, as I've uh, talked about. 
Uh, and one issue which hasn't had much of a look in tonight uh, at all is the existential crisis that we all face uh, around climate change. It's uh, the reason that's led me to the Greens, uh, and the Greens are the only political party that are taking a fully costed policy to this election to phase out coal and move Victoria towards 100% renewable by 2030. And I encourage all of you to go to our policy uh, and see how we'll do that. Um, what we don't uh, have in this state uh, are politicians who want to change the way uh, we help people and provide the range of supports individuals and families need uh, from government. Politics is about choice. Uh, in this election, you can choose to invest in housing and housing stock and help people find safe and secure accommodation, uh, or you can pander to developers. You can choose to support sustainable and renewable energy and reduce pollution, or you can keep uh, destroying our planet and you can choose to elect Greens members uh, to change how politics uh, is done in Victoria. Uh, and I hope to have your number one vote on November 24th. Thank you very much all for being here tonight and thank you to the organisers for a wonderful event and uh, a, a true uh, example of participatory democracy in action. Thank you. Fantastic. That is the end. Will you please join me in thanking all the candidates for their time this evening? Thank you to everyone who participated tonight and thank you for those who stayed on even though it got a little bit late. Have a great evening. Thank you.